briefing portion of the planning commission meeting. There is no public testimony. Briefing means that the cases are presented as a preliminary public presentation for initial questions from the commission. Um, public testimony is not taken at this time, but will be taken when the uh, project comes back before the commission in a hearing setting. Uh, reminder to presenters uh, who are uh, applicants, clearly describe which si slide you're presenting so that uh, folks who might be on the phone and not have visible uh, visibility can participate and understand what is being spoken about. So <clears throat> let's go to the uh, agenda for today. Thank you. Okay, so we have three items on the agenda for briefing. Um, DCP ZDR 2020-07478-908 Penn Avenue, new residential units downtown. Item B is DCP ZDR 2020-03908, address 304 Jamonville Street, renovations. Item C for briefing is DCP ZDR 2019-01580, address 1201 Grandview Avenue, demolition and new construction. And we'll begin with item A, DCP ZDR 2020, 074, uh, lost that, um, maybe. Kate, just go back so I can finish that uh, agenda reading. Thanks, 07478, address 908 Penn Avenue, new residential units downtown, Ms. Kramer, thanks. Thank you. Uh, this is 908 Penn Avenue, and this is in the Golden Triangle Subdistrict C. The application before you is a renovation of interiors to add additional five units within the building. Their existing is 25 units, so the total units within the building will be 30. The maximum allowed for this parcel in the GT is 90 units, so this is well below that. Um, the development activities meeting with the um, registered community organization, which here is the Pittsburgh Downtown Partnership, was held on August 13th. And with that, I will turn the, um, I will ask that the applicants here, um, Brandy Davis and Sean Beasley from Strata, can you, um, can you just say hello while I'm changing the, the presentation here to make sure that we can hear you? Hi, uh, Sean Beasley, Strata Architecture. Can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you. Awesome, I, I'm All gonna right. be presenting. I don't think Brandy will be presenting today. So, uh, ready to get started? Ready to go. Uh, awesome, thanks. Uh, so like Ann said, this is um, residential units in an existing residential property. Um, the image you're looking at is the view off of Penn Avenue. Um, what we will be doing is adding apartments to the second floor, which is the second floor of the storefront, just below the signboard that you can see there on the right. Um, <clears throat> do you wanna to go to the next slide? So the project is surrounded by two buildings um, to the, the west, uh, the right side, the east is a surface parking lot um, that actually has a storefront facing Penn Avenue. So there's a continuous street frontage, um, the, uh, the entry actually is, is to the right or to the left side uh, along Penn Avenue as you look at this image to, um, sorry, Christine, this is, so this is the site plan uh, to be specific for everybody who's, who is listening. Uh, the project is the outline section in the middle. So if you wanna go to the next slide. Pretty simple. These are, you know, stacked units from what is happening above. You know, the 25 units on the the upper five floors. There's a mix of studios, uh, two bedrooms and one bedroom units. Um, everything will be everything's already in place. Stairs, uh, elevations, or no no changes to those. This is really just the demolition of what is a commercial space that is changing over to residential just from a lack of interest from our commercial uh, rentable standpoint. So next slide. So quickly just going through uh, the, the, the projects you know, sustainably, it is um, everything is low flow, uh, everything is uh, LED for a light fixture standpoint and everything is VRF, which is a high efficiency mechanical system. Next slide. 
construction management plan. Uh, this should also be pretty simple there. Everything will be through the existing alleyway uh, between Penn Avenue and Liberty. Uh, we're not planning any street closures at, at during any business hours. Uh, everything will go into an existing dumpster that is already on site. Uh, we're expecting for it to take about eight months total. So I think that is that it. We're next slide. Sorry, accessibility. So the, the existing building is 100% is accessible. Yeah, the project was done um, under the 2009 building code. So at that point, um, everything, including entrances, were, were made accessible and um, nothing will be made, nothing will be done to, to limit that uh, with the new construction. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, we take no public testimony, but are there questions or comments from the commission? No? Okay. okay. Hearing none. Uh, Quick, Christine. Yes. I'm sorry, Miss. how many units again? We are adding five, and there are 25 existing in the building. Okay. The first floor will remain retail. So there won't be a change on the first floor. No, no. the uh, uh, The current space is 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 a two story commercial space. We will be taking the second story back for residential. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. We'll see you uh, in at the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. That brings us to item B, which is DCP ZDR twenty twenty zero three nine zero eight. Address 304 Jamonville Street, renovations. Mr. Gregory. No, commissioners. This is uh, project development uh, plan uh, number DCP ZDR 2020-0308 at, 30, at 304 Jumonville in the Uptown neighborhood. The project involves the interior renovations of an existing two-story former warehouse, as well as exterior renovations and site work to uh, spruce up the existing parking lot, add new parking and add landscaping. There were no requests to the zoning board adjustment for this project. The proposed changes to the facade facing Jumonville Street were reviewed by, des by design review staff. Um, and at this time, there are no outstanding concerns. A small facility stormwater management plan is currently under review with environmental staff. The applicants held a virtual development activities meeting with the two registered community organizations in Uptown, the Hill uh, CDC and Uptown Partners on July 16th, 2020. A copy of the DM report prepared by the neighborhood planners is attached to the briefing report. The project is before the commission as a project development plan as uh, the renovations exceed $100,000 in costs, which requires planning commission review in the Uptown Public Realm District. At this time, and uh, do I have my applicants on the line? John Porter from Desmond is here. Perfect. George Mongell is here. Perfect. All right. Um, we'll turn it over to you guys and uh, just let us know when you do advance the slide. Okay. Thanks, Will. Um, so, as Will said, this is the Uptown Tech Project located at 304 Jamonville in Pittsburgh. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so the proposed use of this is an adapted reuse um, commercial laundry facility that's going to be turned into a, a tech, fle tech flex space. Um, the first floor would be roughly like a warehouse, and then the second floor would be um, office space. Um, so our main scope of the, for the project is, you know, we're doing an interior fit out for prospective tenants. Um, when they get signed on, um, there'll be some restoration of the interior loading docks that get done, a uh, new ADA front entry um, with curtain wall to bring in more natural light, um, cleaning the existing brick and adding new windows and doors, um, and then also replacing the exterior metal panels that have been um, destroyed over the time. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so this just gives an idea of a little bit where we're at in Pittsburgh. Um, so we're right down the street from UPMC Mercy, um, right on Forbes Avenue, or right off of Forbes Avenue. Um, this is on parcel 11K 276 in the Bluff neighborhood. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so this is just a little bit up close view where we're at. 
you can see across the street, the UPMC Mercy Bus Depot um, off of Tustin Avenue. And then we're at the corner here of Germanville Street. And then everything to the right of Germanville is all um, single family residential or um, multifamily residential. And then there's commercial all on the left hand side of our site as well, off of the Boulevard of Allies. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so this is just a view um, from the Boulevard of Allies looking at our building. Um, the right hand side of that shows like an existing um, car facility that is not part of our, um, our car maintenance facility that is not part of our site, but you can still see it. And then on the picture on the right, you can see the context between our existing property on the left hand side and those residential properties that I spoke about before on the right. Can you go to the next slide? Um, so this is just a view looking down Tustin. Um, the view on the left is at that corner of Germanville and Tustin Street, which shows the UPMC bus depot on the right. And then looking back on the right hand side towards that same intersection is the is uh, the bus depots on the left. And then the uh, the renovated um, loading dock that I spoke of before is the one on the right hand side where you see the existing overhead door. And then there's a parking lot on that right hand side too, which we'll reutilize as well. And you'll see that in the landscape plan moving forward. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so here's just some existing photos to get an understanding of what the building looks like. Um, there on the, the front facade, there's a cream brick that's all going to get removed. Um, just on this side, this is where the new ADA entry will go. And then we're also going to introduce a new curtain wall to bring in more natural light. Um, the middle picture shows the one of the loading docks that we're also going to revamp and provide for prospective tenant. And then the picture on the right is just looking back on that front entry as well. Um, and all of these pictures too show the, the parking lot that's going to get revamped, um, which you'll see later on. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, and then this is a picture, or these are pictures of um, the view of Tustin Street. So all this existing brick is gonna get recleaned. Um, the, all the existing openings are gonna be um, removed and we're gonna put new doors and new um, overhead doors in there as well. And then um, that back parking lot, which is on the right hand side, that's going to get revamped. So the dumpster and everything will go away and we'll have new landscaping all along the street, street side here to around the parking lot. Can you go to the next slide, please? So this is the Boulevard of Allies side. Um, right now, you can see there's an issue with um, graffiti and such on the, the side facade. Um, our plan is to clean this all off, clean the brick, and replace all the existing windows in here um, to, to meet the new energy code um, and also provide more natural light since these windows are, you know, they're pretty old and, and they're stained up and, and foggy inside. Um, the seals have broken in them and over time. Can you go to the next slide, please? Drew, do you guys want, Drew or Dina, do you want to speak about this slide? You have to unmute yourself, Dina. Can somebody unmute Dina? Dina, it looks like you're unmuted. We still can't hear you. I was muted. I'm not sure what. Oh, no, there's a different. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that free. There's two Dinas on the call right now. So. John, do you want to continue through? And if we can't get that. Yeah, fixed? 
that's fine. I, I can kind of speak to what they're doing. Um, so this just right here is the site plan that shows the what we're planning on doing. Um, a lot of this is all exterior. So on the Boulevard of Allies side, we're um, tearing up the existing grass that's there and putting in new landscaping to to give this street side, you know, a better presence. Um, and then the two parking lots, um, we're remilling the existing asphalt and then providing new landscaping all along Germanville Street. And then also on the edge of Tustin Street on that little island that sticks out there by the, uh, by the sidewalk. Um, and then with this, we're creating a new ADA entry, which I mentioned before. So you now have ADA parking spots on the front of uh, Tustin Street there to enter into that building, which we didn't have beforehand. Um, and we've also, in this process too, there was originally two curb cuts on Jamonville Street. We've reduced that down to one. Um, based on the, the meeting that we heard before um, from the dam meeting, they had raised a concern about, you know, having too much traffic come off of that street. So this, this right here proposed um, plan sh should help with that reduce traffic flow and, and make it a little bit more safe of an intersection there. Can you go to the next slide, please? Can you guys go to the next slide? Or no, there we go, okay. Um, so this just shows the same thing. It's just a little bit zoomed in view. So one of the issues that we had before um, was there's no accessibility for biking, for people to bike to work. So we've added interior bar bike parking spaces, um, which you can see by that red dash line. Um, oh, can you go back one slide, please? Okay, we can see that. You can probably go to the next slide. Okay, anyway. Um, so the ADA entry on the front, this shows a, a new ramp that comes into the main building. And then also, like I said before, the, the bike parking that's right off the elevator. Um, we've also introduced new interior parking spaces, um, which you can see in the middle. And then, um, okay. And then, so that ADA entry on the front, before there was no ADA entry into the space at all. So this building was completely inaccessible to people with disabilities. Um, and then we are gonna revamp the elevator so that people can get from the front, front of the facade um, up to the second floor, which wasn't really possible beforehand. Can you go to the next slide, please? Did, you, did it switch over yet? It doesn't show. Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah, it um, did. And I, uh, Dina, I, Clavon, I see that you're on. Maybe you weren't before. Do you want to talk about this or? But you don't have sound. That's the issue. Yeah. Okay, John, I think you're still. Oh, wait, she's connecting. She's connecting to audio. Let's see if this is. Okay. Good. Yeah, she'd be better to speak about this. This is her part of the project. Yeah, so. sure. <clears throat> She can always try to call in. She's got her cell phone. Yeah, it's still mute. It's still uh, soundless. <laughs> I mean, I can I can just speak about it. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Can can, can Dina can Dina call in on her phone? Well, let's see if uh, if John can go through it. That's great. And if we have more questions, we can ask. And Dina, why don't you try to call in in the meantime? Then so okay, go ahead, John. Okay. Um. So. This is some of the, the design aspects that you know Dina and her team were looking at. Um, so on that front side of, of Germanville and Tustin, we have um, parking screening. So the idea was that we would have you know some sort of like industrial mesh looking design, um, which we we'll talk about a little bit later. But we plan on getting Arts and HD um, to help us out with that design, so we can kind of engage the community a little bit with that. Um, and then also you can see some of the um, the landscape form. Uh, benches and then lights that are going to be used with on the site as well. 
um, and then also the flexi pave around the, any of the proposed trees so that you know people that are walking by aren't going to break their ankles um, or people riding on a bike won't trip over the, the stumps. Um, and then we're also using pervious um, pavement as well, um, which should help with that stormwater management. Can you go to the next slide, please? It's there, the slide's there. You might have a more of a delay than we do. So. Yeah, I was gonna say it's still showing on my, there's a lag on my side. Okay, um, so these are some of the trees that, the trees and bushes that we're planning on using on the site. Um, these are all approved um, by Lisa, who is the um, landscape um, person for the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and this will be all on the Boulevard of Allies side and then also on the two parking lots as well. Can you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Again, we're good if you. If okay, I'm sorry, I just, it's not showing up on my end, so I'm just waiting. Yeah, so if you can't talk about it till you see it, I understand. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, anyway, so I had mentioned before that we were using um, pervious pavement. Um, so this is just kind of a, a standard detail that we plan on using um, on those parking lots as well. And then, you know, as I mentioned before, the proposed lights are all going to be LED. Um, and then with this um, pervious pavement, you know, we're reducing the uh, the uh, amount of stormwater that should go through on this site and, and be able to be filtered out cleanly and, and effectively. Can you go to the next slide, please. Um, so the existing materials that I mentioned before is that that cream colored brick. That is the plan is to keep that and just clean it. Um, the new curtain wall will be like a champagne color to kind of blend in with the brick and also stand out as well a little bit. It has a little bit of the same tonal values. Um, and then also on that front ADA entry, um, which you'll see in the renders here soon, there is um, we're going to use like a, a modular limestone. Uh, it kind of looks like CMU in terms of how it stacks, but it's going to be a little bit more porous looking than, than uh, CMU is. And then um, all of the existing metal panels that are on the building, we're going to replace with new metal panels. It's kind of like this bronzy color. It shows up a little bit more brown in this picture, but it is more bronze. Um, kind of blends in with that, that brick, to, but also, like I said, stands out as well to kind of give a nice contrast to the to brick and, and not try to match it too because you know the, the building is as old as it is you'll never be able to match that brick moving forward. <clears throat> Can you go to the next slide please? Okay, so these are the building elevations. Um, as you can see on the top elevation, we are adding new windows all on this side. So this would be the proposed office floor. And then on the bottom elevation, um, on the bottom right of that image, you can see that front facade where the new ADA entry would be and the new curtain wall as well. And then also all the dark portions of the building would be the, the metal panels that I spoke of beforehand. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, the Boulevard Ally side, as I mentioned before, that's all going to get new um, storefronts within the existing openings. And then on the Tustin Street side, um, we're going to replace all the, the man doors and overhead doors with new, new doors themselves. And then also fill in the areas that are um, to be removed, like there's um, some existing louvers on the facade that we're going to replace with new glass block to introduce more natural light and also kind of keep with that, you know, modular effect of what the brick has. Um, and then you can also see on the side facade of Tustin Street that, that limestone that I had mentioned as well. Can you go to the next slide, please? 
so as Will had mentioned, um, we had our dam meeting on the on July 16th, and then um, George and his previous team had met with Uptown Partners um, and had a letter of support from them on the 25th of February of this year. Um, and then we also met with the Hill CDC as well um, to try to get their support. Um, we've been working with Samantha Black at um, Arts and HD to do a couple projects with us, um, try to get that community involved as best as we can. So the metal screening that I had mentioned before is something that we want them to look at. And then inside that ADA entry is a, um, we had like a little planter area essentially. And we wanna do, there's a couple Interson um, pieces within the building that we wanna try to, to see if there's a, an artist out there who can create a sculpture from some of this industrial equipment that was in the, the building pre previously. And then, um, you know, also looking at it too in a, a way that maybe we don't see it, but an artist may, there may be other, other opportunities within the building and even on the exterior of the building too, that they see that, you know, could be a cool design. So that's something moving forward that we wanna, we wanna really try to incorporate. And then we've also had, you know, minority business owners and women business owners and veteran business owners involved in this project so far. We, um, Dina and her team is the, the women's building owner. Uh, we were working with Rebuilding Supplies for the minority owners. Um, A1 Holland, also now known as um, Junk Joey's. And then moving forward too, we're gonna engage with, you know, some of those other aspects of the project or other, um, the minority owned and women owned businesses moving forward with the project. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yes. Uh, Brian is, um, he's from Omega Building Company. He's gonna be the, the contractor on this project. Um, and then he really should be the one that speaks about this. Can you unmute him, please? Hi, Brian, I think you're already unmuted, so go ahead. Are you guys able to hear me? We can hear you, yep. Okay, great. Um, yeah, as John said, I'm with Omega Building Company. We're the construction manager for the project. Um, so we, uh, safety is of the utmost importance to us, not only of our, our project, but also the surrounding community. So that's going to be first and foremost where we're working on a project like this, where we're working in close proximity to not only residential, but other businesses in the area. Um, I don't see a whole lot of impact on the community um, from the construction process here. Um, we've got two laid out areas in the front and in the back of the building and existing parking areas. So the majority of our work and um, material lay down, staging, et cetera, will be done in those areas. So I don't, I don't see any road closures or anything along those lines that impact the community. Um, we will have uh, full time supervision on the project. If, you know, if there is an issue with people, we can certainly address it as quickly as possible. Um, our, our project manager will also be, <clears throat> excuse me, working close with our superintendent to make sure that everything goes smoothly. We'll, uh, we'll be following any kind of COVID-19 um, regulations that, that continue to come down uh, and, and make sure that everybody's safe in that regard as well. Um, you know, with the coordinating testing, Ensuring that uh, things are installed properly, um, code compliance, et cetera. Um, and then obviously working with the city and the authorities having jurisdiction to obtain the proper certificates of occupancy. And, uh, um, we expect the project to be, depending on how it's permitted, um, three to five months, probably more in that four month range from. Uh, Next slide. Yeah. Um, so this next slide just shows that front entry that I spoke about before, the ADA entry, and it shows the materials and how it all interacts with the existing brick that's there. Also the new landscaping and, and new um, pavement that is going to be shown. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so this is just from that existing loading dock. Um, on Drummondville Street, looking back towards Tustin Street, um, where the UPMC bus depot is at. Uh, it, same thing, it, sh it shows the, uh, the parking lot and the existing facade and, and what we're, how we're doing the, uh, the new ADA entry as well. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, 
Um, so this next slide is the Boulevard of Allies side. Can you go one more, please? Um, the next slide is the Boulevard of Allies side, which shows all the new landscaping. Um, we're going to have bushes and trees on that side, as well as new grass. Um, and then we're also going to clean the facade as well, which I mentioned before. And then can you go to the next slide? And this is just like an overall. Um, John, this is Ian Kramer. I'm on the Tustin Street uh, slide. Is this the one that you want? Uh, can you go to the next one? I, I kind of, I might have skipped ahead. I'm sorry. I'm trying to speak as it as it goes forward, but it's also not updated on my side. Ah, uh, okay. Well, can you go to? The, I'm on the one last right one that says thank you. Yep, that one, that one right there, the Tustin Street and parking lot render. That one's good. It should be slide number 24. Oh, let me go back to that one then. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so this Tustin Street is the one I had mentioned before. It's just a, it's an overall view of the entire site. It shows the metal screen and shows the proposed sign that we have on the front. Um, you know the the metal panel facade on the the curtain wall, the the limestone facade, the clean brick, all the new all the new lighting all the way down Tustin Street for security purposes, um, and just overall cleaned up entire building. Um, which is our general aspect of the entire building that we're trying to, do, or the entire project that we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. That's really about it. Okay, great. So thank you. Thank you for your team for um, bringing well-labeled drawings. So when we didn't have sound, we could still understand what was being presented. Yeah. Um, okay, at this time, questions or comments from the commission? There is no public testimony. Uh, Commissioner Mingo, yep. I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, one was the sort of um, in looking through the the plans, um, you know, and I and I, I don't know if there's a real answer to this, but I always grapple with the difficulty of the Boulevard of the Allies um, facade. And so, can we go back and look at that facade and look at that landscaping again? We sort of just take an extra look at that slide. For a moment and maybe you can walk me through your thoughts on how you soften that um, Boulevard of the Allies or how you address the rough edges. Are you guys going back to 23? Slide 23? Or do you just want me to speak about it? Um, sure, Mingo, am I on the correct page for, for your, your question? I think this is the front facade. There's a Boulevard of the Allies one. Maybe it was the third, the last slide. There was a thank you. There was the, there yeah. we go. There we go, yep. Oh. Okay. Ina, do you want to speak about this a little bit? Can you hear us now? No, you're still on mute. Yeah, so uh, can you, so I'm, I'm seeing trees and some grass and then a lot of mulch. No, it's not mulch. It's, it's actually grass um, on there. And then, like you said, the trees and the bushes, um, that is our way of softening that corner. I mean, right now, there's nothing there. There's overgrown bushes that have been there for a number of years that aren't, there's no design idea behind it at all. It's just, they were just planted at some point in time. Um, you know, and, and as I mentioned before, you know, there's been an issue with graffiti in the past. So, this right here is going to deter people from going and hopefully spray painting that facade and kind of keeping this, as you mentioned, softer and, and cleaner as a whole, you know, especially because the Boulevard of Allies is such a prominent facade. Um, you know, we're, we're not doing much to it, but what we're doing is, you know, I think is going to make a difference in terms of what that overall facade looks like. It's not going to be such a big blank facade like it is now. There's going to be some rhythm and pattern to it. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my last question was about the meetings with the neighborhood groups. Um, sort of what kind of feedback did you get from the neighbors about this project? Did you um, address the, that feedback? Yeah, I mean, we met with them um, and a lot of the feedback was driven towards, you know, the community and how we're going to get them involved. And you know, since then we've we met with Arts and HD um, to try to incorporate some of the community businesses. We've also and try to include you know some of the minority businesses as well that are also part of that community that live there and operate there as well. Um, 
and you know we are limited with this project in terms of its overall you know site like we can't some of the comments were like add a park to it or put low-income housing there you know it's an existing building by right um so without tearing down the entire building we can't put low-income housing there and we're also limited in terms of the overall site by putting like a park in for example because we need you know parking spaces for the tenants that are going to operate out of that business um so some of the other comments that we've had too is like they wanted to add more lights um, on the facade for security, which we've done. Um, and then, you know, like I said before, bringing in the community as much as we can. So teaming up with Samantha and her team and the local artists as well to, to try to accomplish that as much as we can. Yeah, and I can speak a little bit to that too, um, Dawn. So in addition to um, engaging artists in HD, which we, we've been trying to get a meeting with them and haven't had much success um, to date. We've been, it's been uh, a couple months, I say, since we've been trying to have a meeting with them on the site um, to get some artists there to walk through the property, come up with some ideas. Um, we're, we're trying to incorporate art into the project that is um, that speaks to the, to, the, to the community there, to the local. But we want to use things that came from the building, too. And that was actually kind of their idea in conjunction with our, you know, we've got some some heavy metal type things that have come out of the building, some steel structures that they think would be really great to, to create a sculpture in the in that entry area where we've got the ramp and the planer and whatnot. Um, we talked about maybe some art on the outside of the building. Um, so we're, we're trying to work with them and come up with some really creative ideas to, to tie the building kind of in the community because um, as you probably see it, it's sort of like the commercial industrial building stuck in the middle of a bunch of resident, residential type stuff aside from the UPNC facility. Um, so we're trying to, to tie it in somehow. Um, in, in addition to the, the minority and women-owned businesses that we've already engaged there that are on the, the slide of the uh, We have some other ones that, that we've engaged as well. Macarol Concrete will be doing the concrete work on the project for WD. Um, but we're, we're, we're somewhat limited in our scope. And uh, we, we had talked to the Hill CDC about this as well in um, trying to engage minority contractors that are um, legitimate is the best way to put it. And, and, we, and we understood what I meant by that, where we want to use people that are that actually are benefiting from the work rather than somebody that is just passing through using another contractor just to, to, to further um, you know, just to say that, hey, we use the minority business. We, we want somebody that actually is in the game, that's got, you know, real skills that we're using on the property. But um, with the limited scope of just, you know, that little entry addition, we've got some miscellaneous interior work, some painting, um, some framing and drywall. It's kind of hard to engage minority or local um, community businesses because there just aren't any that perform some of our changes functions. Um, but we're, you know, we're willing to, we're trying to work through um, approval with the whole CDC, but um, I don't know if you've heard a roadblock, but we haven't heard much from them of the points in the last uh, 30 years. So that was my last question. Did you have a chance to meet with the Hill District Development Review Panel? I know you don't, are not required to for this project, but. Uh, we did meet with them. Um, John, I don't recall when it was. I think it may have been in July uh, when we when we met with them, and we went through the discussion of what what they were asking for, and we gave them the majority of what they were asking for. Um, I'll, I'll let the owner um, speak if he wishes to speak about the things that we didn't get to them. Um, but yeah, I think we're we're trying to work with them to get through the process of doing everything there. Um, that they're just Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay. Yes, I, I have one. Yep, Holly. Okay, uh, you mentioned that you're putting in a new ADA entrance. Do you have any plans for putting an ADA accessible bathroom in the building at this okay. point, or would that come after this tenant uh, had been procured for the office yeah, upstairs? Um, let me go, can you guys go back? Let me tell you which slide it is, wait a second. I think it's... <clears throat> It's the one with uh, the landscape interior plan. I think it's like slide. 
So if you go to slide 11 or 12, either one of them, you can kind of see it. Um, so on the first floor, we're going to have a, a men's and women's facility that both is going to have ADA um, counters for the sink, and they're also going to have an ADA toilet room. Um, and then also on the second floor, which isn't shown on this because it's more interiors and this means more for exteriors, yeah. um, we'll also have the same condition. We'll have, you know, an ADA sink for, for both men and women's, and then we'll also have ADA toilet rooms as well. Um, and then all the drinking fountains will all be ADA. They're, all the doors will be ADA. Everything about it will be ADA. So, and that's something we don't have now in this building. Um, it's kind of yeah. cut off. But on this building, there's two existing single restrooms. That's that's all that's in the entire building. Um, and they're not ADA at all. Um, so we're completely revamping that to make it user friendly. Good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the Yeah, I have a question. Rina? This follows up on Commissioner Mingo and somewhat the same, but um, in the briefing, it wasn't clear that when you were talking to the Hill CDC, though you did say you talked to the Hill Development Review Panel. We um, we didn't actually speak to the panel itself. We spoke to Felicity Williams and her team and in um, a couple of her team. Um, we did an initial meeting right after our dam meeting um, to talk to them about you know what they were looking for, what we needed to provide for the the actual meeting itself, um, and we did provide all that information. Um, but we did not meet with the panel itself. Um, we did not go through the final process of everything. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, keep the conversation up with the Hill CDC. Um, it's not, I mean, this slides better than I think what was in the briefing, but it's not clear what, you know, that it, what it, it seems like you could have a stronger commitment to um, uh, WBE and MBEs, especially. And given in the Hill, the expertise at the Hill CDC in terms of some of the, you know, if you're, if you're reaching out to enough companies, um, so this project should you know, clearly have a very, very strong presence. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's something we talked to Felicity about, you know, we, we said to her, you know, we welcome the idea of if you have businesses that you've worked with in the past that you would recommend for the, the small scope of work that we're actually doing here. You know, we welcome the idea of meeting with them, talking to them, you know, giving them every opportunity to, to bid on the job. You know, it's something that Brian and, and his team work on as we move forward with construction, but you know, that's that's something we definitely want to do. If I can add, this is George Mongel, developer and owner. Um, we do appreciate all those questions. Just sort of to take it into two steps. We did meet and work through with Uptown Partners and um, did receive a letter of support on February 25th of 2020. As part of that letter, there were two mandatory, mandatory conditions um, that they would like to see done, both of which have been addressed, which was the improvement of landscaping on the Boulevard of the Allies, um, which we were working through with their input. Um, so we're very happy about the progress and we're going to continue to work uh, to make that sustainable, just particularly given the uh, traffic that comes off the Boulevard side. The second one was there was um, lighting that they wanted on Tustin Street. We did bring in some artistic lighting through landscape forms, which is shown on the presentation. Um, to provide, you know, a safe uh, way of passage uh, along that sidewalk area, even though it does dead end after our property, we thought that was also a very um, positive uh, attribute for the building. Then they had two negotiable conditions in their letter of support, uh, one of which the in initial facade had these vertical mullions, which were, as they called Home Depot orange, uh, we appreciate their candor and direction. Um, as you can see, that has been eliminated. We agree with that. Um, Desmond came in as the new architect of record, uh, and we polished up the entire facade um, after working with uh, the input from the uh, Uptown partner team regarding the merits of the design. Then they were looking at potential art installations, both the Boulevard, the Allies side, and other areas of the building. Um, the Boulevard side uh, were welcome to input. Um, I'm, I'm not an artist, as nor is the team, but creative ideas um, could result in something pretty spectacular. The other areas were mentioned during the presentation that we think will have a very long lasting impact, everything from the monument sign uh, to the to the screening that were proposed. I mean, we have placeholders there now, as well as in the building entryway, instead of doing a potted plant, we're looking at some really attractive uh, local sculptural artists to provide a permanent installation into the building. 
Second, uh, we did reach out to the Hill CDC. Uh, Desmond submitted our DRP application on uh, July 30th. The DR application was um, completed given this project. We, everyone does know it's a privately funded adaptive reuse project. We did not submit itemized detailed sources and uses um, uh, as part of that DRP application. Uh, we have uh, persistently followed up and have asked for you know, the opportunity to present um, uh, even though the uh, itemized sources and uses are not presented for this project, um, just given the fact it's just private in nature and it's, it's a, a buy right project. But we are adamant that the continued engagement continues not only now, but going forward. John, uh, Brian, and Dina all on this will continue to have updates to the community as we progress. We think that's important as well as hopefully working on other things to, just to create a really good revitalized neighborhood. This was a two and a half year old vacant commercial building uh, in substantial need of, of repair. And uh, the team has done an outstanding job collectively and working with all stakeholders. Well, that answers my final question. Is there any public money in this project? <laughs> no, there is not. Yeah. Okay. No uh, further questions. Okay, great. Any other questions from other commissioners? Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you at the next meeting. Um, so that takes us to item C, which is DCP ZDR 2019-01580, address 1204 Grandview Avenue, demolition, demolition and new construction. Mr. Gregory. Hello, once again, commissioners. Uh, let's try this again, unmuted. Uh, this is project number DCP ZDR 2019-01580, located at 1204 Grandview Avenue in the Mount Washington neighborhood. This project involves the demolition of the existing uh, commercial structure and the new construction, or new construction of a three-story single unit dwelling with integral parking off Grandview Avenue. The, uh, the project did require um, a zoning board of adjustment variance, uh, which was granted under ZBA case 23 of 2020. Uh, they asked for dimensional setbacks to the three foot uh, minimum setback to go to about six inches on each side. Uh, the zoning board granted this with a condition that um, uh, with the with condition of a design feature of an angle rear, which has been incorporated into the current uh, design. The proposed uh, building design was reviewed by design staff, and at this point, staff have accepted the proposed renovations um, as presented. They have no outstanding design concerns. Uh, the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure have approved the two proposed Kirkcrest off Grandview Avenue um, for the two separate garages. Uh, staff have accepted a preliminary uh, geotechnical report for the project um, based on an analysis of um, available resources, but without any borings. A second geotechnical report will be conducted after the demolition of the existing structure, and that will be required as part of the zoning approvals for the new construction of a single unit dwelling. This project is before the board as a project development plan as uh, a substantial new construction in the Grandview Public Realm District. And with that, I'll turn it over to their team. Um, so Chad and Mike, um, are you guys up and running? It looks like they're here. Michael, you're unmuted. Do you want to um, speak and see if we can hear you? Chad, you're also unmuted. Can you say something? Yes, can you hear me? We can yes. hear you. We apparently can't hear Michael, though. <clears throat> All right, um, Chad, um, I'll turn it over to you to walk us through the project. So when you want to advance the slide, uh, just say next and we'll uh, move it forward for you. Excellent, great. Thank you, William. I appreciate all the work on this project. Um, this is, uh, as uh, William mentioned, it is on Grandview Avenue, um, and it is a very prominent area for us to create uh, a facade that is generally in keeping with the fabric of Mount Washington. 
And <clears throat> you'll see that we have proposed a single family home, uh, which is allowable by right, but we have done this in such a way that would allow this particular building to not only be a single family home, but also be a commercial building in the future. Um, so everything has been designed for a commercial building so that it could be adaptively reused if the owner so chooses to change it into something different in the future. One of the challenges with the existing building is the existing building um, didn't have proper foundations. There were no foundations on this building. So modifying the existing building was very challenging, adding additional weight. Uh, the structural engineer that took a look at it said we really couldn't do a whole lot with it given the existing foundations and the location of it. If you want to go ahead and advance the slide. Um, just for those of you, just kind of a general overview of where this is. Um, you can kind of go through some of the maps. This is uh, almost the quintessential picture of Pittsburgh. When you look out the back side of Grandview Avenue, this is looking down right on the point of Pittsburgh. Uh, so very highly visible. Uh, if you want to go ahead and advance one more slide. Just again, um, there's a couple of restaurants. There's also the Duquesne Incline which is a couple, which is about a block away from this particular project. Um, so it's, uh, it's in a great location. If you wanna go ahead and advance one more. Um, just showing the existing building. Um, the existing building does have kind of a little sawtooth setback to it currently. And um, if you wanna go ahead and it does show that this is in the, um, an abandoned mine area. So we're well aware of the particulars of the existing mine. Uh, we also have Mike on the phone, which um, I'm hoping that at some point he can speak to that a little more. So we're very aware of the challenges of building on Mount Washington. We have engaged a structural engineer, a civil engineer, and a geotechnical engineer, and the owners of the project that proposed to live in this residence actually own a construction concrete company. So they're well aware of the amount of mine grouting, uh, caisson building and grade beams. So if we can go to the next one, um, I think we can keep going just to go to the next one. That's a landslide. Just pulling up some of the images of the Pittsburgh website located in each slope region. We can go one more, please. Um, this was a uh, this was a slide showing the average slope that was done by an engineer to make sure that we're within or without of the slope range and the concerns for that. If you could go to the next one. Um, again, just showing you the demolition of the existing building and the footprint of this building as it relates to the buildings next door. We could go to the next slide. And then um, the proposed building, what you're looking at here is you're looking at a building that has a rectangular foundation with caissons driven into that. And you're looking at cantilevered grade beams that go out over the existing area. So we're proposing not to disrupt any area except for the area that's currently being disrupted by the existing building. So the round circles are demonstrating uh, the caissons themselves. The right side of the project is Grandview and the left side is the hillside. So as you can see the outline of the existing building, we're holding the building back far enough to make sure to not disturb any of the undisturbed area. And we anticipate on probably driving those caissons down once we find out more information, but we know that there are mines at about 93 feet. And the proposal is to, once we reach uh, demolition, to actually do the borings at that point. Uh, as William had mentioned, we have a preliminary, um, we have actually uh, preliminary geotechnical reports that are gonna tell us approximately what we have to do. But once we get to the next stage of being able to take the building down, we'll have a better idea and we'll submit a final report. You could advance one more time. Again, the uh, caisson grade beam design uh, done by a structural engineer. Um, this is in Pittsburgh. This is showing the size of the grade beams. Everything you're looking at from the left-hand side of the drawing is being cantilevered out over the, over the slope of the hill. If you can advance one more. 
uh, generally a view of the front, um, really allowing uh, some fenestrations that uh, you know would allow for future storefronts at any time if the garage doors were changed back to some sort of a storefront, trying to keep that contextual fabric of the building to uh, mimic uh, what, what is going on there. Currently, there is kind of a double height glass curtain wall with um, French doors, Juliet balconies, and um, just facing the facade of Grandview Avenue. If you want to advance one more. Uh, this is the rear facade, just showing um, the, the glass, the curtain walls on the rear of the building as it looks down over the city of Pittsburgh, um, showing contextual height studies of the rear elevation, showing the locations of the grade beams and adjacency to other buildings on Grandview Avenue. If you could advance one more. This is the existing facade um, with, uh, it was existing, it's an existing restaurant currently. And the proposal is to raise this structure given the quality of the foundations, the walls and the ability for it to carry any load. And if you could go one more, the proposal is to uh, create a right, white brick building with uh, black windows, um, again, with uh, two curb cuts and um, allowing the owners to both park off street on both sides. If you can advance one more. And in the rear of the building, this is really more conceptual at this point um, to until we get into the actual design of the back, but the back that we imagine will be fairly glassy. This shows that how we have um, pulled the building back um, to the building to the left of the slide to show the uh, to show the building cut off at a 45 degree angle with the next door neighbor that requested that. We did receive a letter of uh, a letter of approval, a letter of, uh, from the building on the right hand side to build up to that, and as as uh, William had mentioned, that was approved in the Zoning Board of Approvals. Do you want to go to the next slide? Okay, just general questions. Um. Okay, thank you. At this time, we take no public testimony. Are there questions or comments from the commission? Commissioners, any questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, commissioners. Um, we will, uh, we, that ends the briefing portion of our hearing. We'll be back at 2.10 to start the hearing portion of our agenda. So thank you.
All right, commissioners and staff, if you're here, go ahead and uh, turn on your cameras again. Okay. Hi, this is the court reporter. You're able Hi. to hear me? You're joining Hi. us. I can hear you. Yep. Okay. I was looking for an agenda and I don't see anything listed on the city's website um, after a date of mid June. Uh, I think somebody can forward that to you. Okay. All right. Um, in order to not put my email address out to the entire world, if I put my email address in the chat box, will that suffice? Um, somebody will reach out to you and tell you how I don't know how to do that. So. Okay. All right. So, and also we have um, you, Commissioner Mondor. We have, I saw Ms. O'Neill, uh, Ms. Dietrich, Ms. Mingo. Anyone else? Um, I'll go through the, uh, the uh, call to the attendee. Okay. Here. And for accessing the agenda, you should have a chat response with the link for that. Okay. And I'm sorry, I know I recognize your voice. I don't, I know, I know that you'll pop in at some point and like read items. Who are you? Uh, I'm Kathleen Oldry. Can you spell the last name? And are you Kathleen with a C or a K? Uh, with a K, and it's O L D R E Y. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to give a count. Right, thanks. I'm going to give a countdown to start. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome back to the hearing portion of the Planning Commission meeting for the 15th of September, 2020. Uh, everybody is here, and I'm going to do roll call so that we can uh, know which commissioners are present. Commissioner Askey. Not present. Commissioner Blackwell. Present. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Brown, not present. Commissioner Burton Falk, not present. And Commissioner Dietrich. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Dick. Actually, I don't see her on the screen, but I do believe she might have dropped off and will join us. Uh, Commissioner Mingo. Here. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mondor here and Commissioner O'Neill. Present. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, five items on the agenda today. I'll read through all five. Approval of commission minutes, correspondence, hearing and action, plan of lots, and director's report. Uh, we'll begin with approval of commission minutes. We're in receipt of minutes from the 11th of August and the 25th of August. Assuming that you have reviewed the minutes and forwarded any corrections, uh, do I have a motion to approve? And I'd like to ask for motions to, for these separately. Uh, knowing that some people might have been absent. So do I have a motion to approve the minutes for 11th of August, 2020? So moved. So moved, Commissioner Dietrich, second? Second, Dick. Commissioner Dick. Thank you. Okay, all in favor? Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's go back to the way we have to do it. Uh, Commissioner uh, Blackwell? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Dietrich? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Commissioner Mingo? Aye. Commissioner Mondor? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Abstain. Okay, thank you. That takes us to uh, 25th of August to have a motion to approve the 25th of August. So moved. So moved. Commissioner Mingo, second. Second, Commissioner O'Neill. Thank you. Okay, a roll call a vote. Um, Commissioner Blackwell? I, sorry, I had a mute problem. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Commissioner Dietrich? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Commissioner Mingo? Aye. Commissioner Mondor? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Aye. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to items of correspondence. Let me open up the items of correspondence and read them. Okay, we are in receipt. Uh -oh. hmm. Of items of correspondence from the following people. Uh, okay, uh, regarding uh, DCP ZDR 2020 03908 address 304 Jamonville Street. Uh, 
Niasha Johnson, Hill District Consensus Group, Justin Liang, Hill Lombo LLC, R.B. Banks Bankstrom, um, Hill District Consensus Group, Marimbo Malines, President and CEO, Hill CDC. Regarding DCP HN 2020-00372, Heron Hill Pumping Station, Mary Fletcher, Belfield Area Citizens Association President, DCP HN 2020-00370, the Gallagher Kiefer House from Matthew Falcone, Preservation Pittsburgh, Paul Subowitz, University of Pittsburgh Vice Chancellor, Community and Governmental Relations, and Mary Fletcher, Belfield Area Citizens Association President. DCP ZDR 2019-02015, uh, that's address 1501 Penn Avenue, Matt Falcone, Preservation Pittsburgh. DCP HN 2020-00090, St. John Vianney Church, Historic Nomination, Anne Toland, Aaron Sukunik, Executive Director, Hilltop Alliance, Francis Jack Schmidt, James Homer, Pittsburgh Historic Landmark Foundation member. Ron Tregesser. Bob Cress, President of the St. George Church Preservation Society. Melissa McSwiggin, Preservation Pittsburgh, and Councilman Bruce Kraus. Regarding DCP HN 2020-00240, Spring Hill Elementary School Historic Nomination from Matthew Falcone, Preservation Pittsburgh, letter from Spring Hill Civic League. Regarding DCP HN 2020-00373, Hanauer Rosenberg House Historic Nomination from Matthew Falcone, Preservation Pittsburgh, letter from Dr. Barbara Burston. Letter from East End Community Council, or East Allegheny Community Council. Petition from National Council of Jewish Women's Greater Philadelphia Section. Letter from National Council of Jewish Women. Letter from National Council of Jewish Women Pittsburgh Section. National Museum of American Jewish History and Rodef Shalom. Notice of appeal from Troyani Group regarding Market Street Properties and notice of appeal from Lumania properties regarding DCP lot 2020-78. Okay. Uh, that takes us through our items of correspondence and we um, move on to hearing and action. So for the next items under hearing and action, we'll first hear the presentation, then take public testimony. The commission will then deliberate and take action. So after the presentations for the hearing, we will invite testimony. When public testimony is called, please use the raise hand function. Um, for participants on the phone, the raise hand is star nine. Again, for if you're on the phone, the raise hand is star nine. If the staff needs to change your status in the meeting, there may be a pause or a reconnection circle. Please be patient and your mic will unmute. The chat is disabled. Um, and please use the Q&A for technical assistance only. Thank you. Okay, so with that, uh, we have four items on hearing in action. And for those who cannot see the agenda, I'll read through all four. Item one is DCP HN 2020-00372, Heron Hill Pumping Station Historic Nomination. Item two is DCP HN 2020-00370, Gallagher Kiefer House Historic Nomination. And item three is HN 2020-00090, St. John Vianney Church Historic Nomination. Item four is DCP ZDR 2019-02015, address 1501 Penn Avenue, Demolition and New Construction. So we begin with item one, DCP HN 2020-00372, Heron Hill Pumping Station Historic Nomination, Ms. Quinn. Um, hello everyone, my name is Sarah Quinn. I'm the preservation planner for the city. Um, as you all were briefed regarding this property just a few weeks ago, I'll go ahead and try and keep it brief here. But the Heron Hill Pumping Station is located in North Oakland. Um, it's two stories tall and consists of a double height space above grade on the first floor with a ground floor below. It's exposed on its east side and continues to serve its original function of pumping water from the Highland Park Reservoir up to the Heron Hill Reservoir for distribution throughout the city. 
The boiler house is also two stories in height, although lower in overall height than the pump house. Its function changed when the facility converted from oil to oil power to electricity in 1931. Designed as one building, the pump house and boiler house have similar architecture, architectural details. And could you advance the slide, please? Thank you. There's also a laboratory building which faces west and is three bays wide and five bays deep. On the first floor, on the first story, the walls are red brick laid in a running bond with smooth mortar joints, similar to the pump station building. The bays of the first story are demarcated by classically derived brick pilasters with simple Tuscan capitals. When originally constructed around 1897, the laboratory building was three stories tall. Um, and it was sometime around 1909 that the second floor was removed and the roof was constructed in its present form. <clears throat> in 1896, City Council, Council set aside $100,000 from the sale of bonds for a new Heron Hill pumping station lower on the property, closer to Center Avenue and out of harm's way. Architect William S. Fraser was selected to design the new larger facility and the RFP was first advertised on February 8, 1896. The Historic Review Commission voted to provide a positive recommendation to city council and they considered it significant under several criteria. The first one is criteria, which, criteria three, which is an exemplification of an architectural type style or design. The Heron Hill pumping station is an, is an example of classical revival or neoclassical style um, architecture successfully ad adapted to the specific program of late 19th century waterworks. Um, and there's a note in the nomination that said that style was particularly popular in Pennsylvania from 1895 to 1950. The property is also significant under criteria four with which with its identification as the work of an architect, engineer, designer, or builder. The Heron Hill pumping station is significant as a skillfully designed surviving example of the work of late 19th century Pittsburgh architect William Smith Fraser, um, who lived from 1852 to 1897. Fraser's career was short but illustrious and the architectural output was considered and varied. In a span of only 18 years, he earned numerous commissions, published in national and international journals, and was the most highly sought after designers of his generation in the city. It's, it's only his premature death from cancer at age 44 before his career could even peak that has kept him from being studied more by architectural historians. The property is also six, significant under criteria five as an exemplification of important planning and urban design techniques distinguished by innovation, rarity, uniqueness, and overall quality of design. The Heron Hill pumping station is significant for its role in dependably providing public water to Pittsburgh's notorious hilly neighborhoods for over a century and for allowing rapid urban development of the city's east end in the early 20th century. Following the largest annexation of surrounding communities in the city in 1868, long-term infrastructure improvements were implemented. Key among those was construction of the water distribution network associated with the Heron Hill pumping station, where water is piped from the Highland Reservoir, number one, to Heron Hill pumping station, and then to the Heron Hill Reservoir through a 12-inch water main. Located in one of the highest hills in the city with an elevation of 1,261 feet, the reservoir then provided water primarily by gravity to resident neighborhood, residential neighborhoods on four lower hilltops, Heron Hill, Squirrel Hill, Garfield Hill, and Huberton Hill with a range of elevations. Finally, the property is significant under Criterion 10, which is unique location and distinctive physical appearance or presence representing a familiar visual feature. The Heron Hill pumping station is significant for a number of reasons as a visual landmark in North Oakland, a neighborhood that is undergoing a considerable amount of new development. The property was found to have a significant amount of integrity remaining, even though the openings for the windows have been bricked in 
the shape and size of those openings have not changed from their original and could easily be restored with the help of um, photographic support. And, and if you could go back to the previous photograph, see, we know exactly what was there. So for that reason, like the Historic Review Commission, I recommend that you guys provide a positive recommendation to City Council. That's what I have. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Okay, at this time we take public testimony. Um, Kathleen, are, are there, is there anyone who has uh, raised their hand or indicated they would like to testify? Yes, we do have hands raised. Okay, great, go ahead. Matthew Falcone, you are unmuted. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Matthew Falcone, 417 Lockhart Street, Pittsburgh, 15212. Um, I, I just wanted to thank uh, you for your consideration of this application and also thank um, the city and PWSA in their partnership on putting this nomination forward. Um, what you're looking at today is significant for all the reasons that Ms. Quinn stated, um, but also because it is the oldest piece of um, water infrastructure that remains in the city of Pittsburgh. And um, I, I'd also would like to thank uh, Baca in particular and the community engagement process that we went through with this nomination was particularly enriching because our focus was almost entirely on the building itself and um, kind of the mechanics of it. And through that discussion, um, the community really sees this as an important landmark um, within their neighborhood, particularly because of the green space that surrounds the building and is becoming increasingly rare in Oakland. Um, and the green space itself is reflective of kind of historic approaches to water and um, kind of segregating out it from the urban environment. And you kind of, you see that, that on a much larger scale with Highland Park, but on a much tinier scale in Oakland, it's wonderful that we still have um, this building with us. So again, thank you for your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great, thank you, Matthew. Are there others who would like to testify, Kathleen? Uh, no other hands are raised at this time. Okay. We'll give it a minute if there's anyone who would like to testify, um, or if you're on your phone, you can press star nine. Okay. Uh, questions or comments? Uh, one more hand. Okay, go ahead. Kathy Gallagher, you are unmuted. Um, my name is Kathy Gallagher. I live half a block from the Heron Hill pumping station, and it has been a significant part of my life for all of my 75 years. As a child, I walked past and saw at that time the windows were open and we could see the huge pipes that were pumping the water out. So as a member of the community, still live in the community, it's a very important of our neighborhood, a very important part of our neighborhood. And I couldn't agree more with Matthew about the additional green space, which we are finding very scarce. So I hope you will support the preservation of our neighborhood treasure. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen, is there anyone else? Not at this time, no. Thank you. So that closes public testimony. Other questions or comments from the commission? Okay. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Matt and Sarah for putting this application together and to acknowledge the investment that went into infrastructure, our city's infrastructure, you know, a century ago and uh, hoping that it inspires us to make similar investments that are worthy of a hundred year celebration from now. So um, uh, at this time then is, uh, would, uh, do I have a motion to approve as stated in our reports? So moved. So moved, Commissioner Dietrich, second. Second. Commissioner Dick, okay, I'll do a roll call. Uh, Commissioner Blackwell? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Dietrich? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Commissioner Mingo? Aye. Commissioner Mondor? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Aye. Okay, thank you. Okay, that takes us to item two, which is DCP HN 2020-00370, the gallagher Kiefer House Historic Nomination, Ms. Quinn. 
the, the Gallagher Kiefer House is located at 234 North Dithridge Street in the North Oakland neighborhood. Um, it's a two and a half story wood frame residential dwelling. And you can see from the photos, um, it's a shingle style Victorian home um, because the second store is, story is covered with, covered with wooden shingles. Um, and specifically, it says the building is represents an adaptation of the style to the four square building typology. But Anne, Annie Neville Craig Davidson had 234 North Dithard Street built in 1893, possibly for a home for her married daughter, Mary Davidson Reed. The house ended up becoming a rental. Um, and one of the tenants was um, a notable religious figure in the city, um, Reverend Henry T. McClellan who was um, a pastor in the Belfield Presbyterian Church. By 1914, the property was purchased by Patrick and Catherine Gallagher at a cost of $10,000. Patrick Gallagher was the president of Duquesne Construction Company and helped to build many of the schools and churches around the Pittsburgh area, most notably the Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church in Shadyside St. Boniface Church on the north side. The Gallaghers raised nine children at 234 North Dithridge Street and their defendant, descendants still live in the home today. Um, it's only owned, it's been owned by two families in its entire 130 year existence. But the, pro, the Historic Review Commission voted to provide City Council with a positive recommendation um, and found the property historic under several different criteria. Um, the first one was um, identification with a person or persons who significantly contributed to the cultural, historic, archaeology of the area. 234 North Dithridge Street is directly associated with the prominent Pittsburgh builder, Patrick F. Gallagher. While the house was not constructed by P.F. Gallagher, he owned and lived in the house during the period in which he rose to prominence at the Duquesne Construction Company. Gallagher's work there had an extensive and lasting impact on the built legacy through Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania, particularly, particularly on ecclesiastical architecture within the Catholic diocese. While the Duquesne Construction Company was primarily known for its construction of religious architecture, they also undertook several notable secular projects under Mr. Gallagher, notably are the Allegheny General Hospital and a tipple for the Butler Junction Coal Company. The property is significant under criteria three as well as its exemplification of an architectural type style design distinguished by innovation or rarity. This building meets this criteria because of its unique rarity of the shingle style architecture in North Oakland and the unique manner in which the residence was altered by P.F. Gallagher to reflect his work in relationship with the Duquesne Construction Company. Characteristic elements that reflect shingle style architecture can be seen in the seedly pitched Gambrel roof, side shingled second floor walls without corner boards and integral portion absence of highly decorative detailing. The property maintains um, a moderate high degree of integrity for many characteristics um, as it is virtually unchanged from when it was constructed. Um, you know, the, 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 the nomination said that the house enjoys a moderate degree of integrity regarding its setting, um, but you have to look outside of its parcel to see that. On its parcel itself, it's relatively intact. So um, but anyways, for all these reasons, as I said, the Historic Review Commission voted to provide a positive recommend to recommendation to City Council, and, and I recommend you guys do as well. And that's, that's where I am. Okay, At this time, we take public testimony. Is there anyone signed up to speak with regards to this project? Uh, we do have hands raised. Okay. Uh, Matthew Falcone, you are unmuted. Hi. Um, again, Matthew Falcone, 417 Lockhart Street. 
15212. Uh, I, I, I want to again thank you for your consideration of this nomination and, um, and just kind of reiterate what an exceptional house this is. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with this part of Oakland, um, it, it, it almost strikes you as the house from up because it looks like it's been put into a snow globe as the world has changed around it. It looks exactly the same. Um, and that is largely thanks to the efforts of the Gallagher family who's owned the house um, over the years. What was particularly rewarding about this nomination is, is um, while working on it, it, we couldn't quite place where we knew the Duquesne Construction Company from until we started digging into what they had constructed and what P.F. Gallagher was responsible for. And um, looking back upon Preservation Pittsburgh's previous history and nominations that are written, the Duquesne Construction Company features very prominently in lots of buildings. And uh, we think that this is particularly special, not only as a wonderful architectural example um, of shingle style architecture and um, rightfully calling attention to P.F. Gallagher, but also being able to call attention to everyone that helps our, shape our built environment. But there is so much focus on architects and designers, but the folks that are involved in construction and the builders in our community have uh, equally important role and um, in bringing a built environment that we have today into life. So it's wonderful to be able to elevate their narratives as we have with architects and designers in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. There are others who would like to speak with regards to this project? No other hands are raised at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, that closes public testimony. Are there questions or comments from the commission? Yeah. Okay. Commissioner? Uh, yes. I, Dick, yeah. I would, I would, um, as a resident of North Oakland, I would like proudly like to nominate this lovely home as um, for historical preservation. Are you are you forwarding the motion to approve, Commissioner Dick? Yes, I am. Okay. Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, so moved. And uh, do I have a second? Second. Second, Commissioner Dietrich. Okay. Uh, roll call, Commissioner Blackwell. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Dietrich. Aye. Commissioner Dick. Aye. Commissioner Mingo? Aye. Commissioner Mondor? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Aye. Okay, thank you. That takes us to item three, DCP HN 2020-00090, St. John Vianney Church Historic Nomination, Ms. Quinn. Um, so St. John Vianney Church um, is located at 225 Allen Street in the Allentown neighborhood. And historically, this church has also been known as the St. George Roman Catholic Church, too. So just wanted to bring that out, get that on the record. Um, but as you can see, it's a very large and imposing church right on the sidewalk. And Rachel, or Rachel, gosh. Um, Anne, can you go to the next picture, please? You can see how this, this is very tall and imposing over the neighborhood houses. So it, there's definitely a certain feel of the neighborhood because of this building. Um, but its foundation, string courses and ornament, ornamentation are limestone. And the field of each facade is comprised of red brick laid in a Flemish bond pattern. Resource features deeply raked mortar joints which accentuate the complex brick pattern and enhanced dimension of the resource's exterior. The resource exemplifies a traditional basilica plan. It is cruciform and possesses a narthex nave, side aisles, recessed clearest, clear story trans, <laughs> transept and rounded apse. I apologize, the tongue twister. Um, the resource measures three bays wide by 10 bays deep, whereas the nave rises only one story in height. The resource rises to an overall height of six stories when considered its paired towers. Is there, is there one more photo, Anne? There we go, you can see the side of the building right there. Okay. The roof is clad in terracotta tile as well. And um, illustrating the predominance of 
Allentown's early German ethnic composition, St. George's Parish was formed in 1886. This is the second church on the site. The first one they built in 1886 ended up being too small. So they had to go ahead and build another one on. Um, and then this one was constructed in 1910 by the architectural firm of Edmund B. Lang and Brother. They were selected to design the new St. George Church. The design of the church was attributed to Herman Lang and the Duquesne Construction Company, which we just heard about, the owner of which lived in our last landmark, was the builder of this church. Um, so it's just all fits nicely together. It's Pittsburgh thing. <laughs> As German born immigrant Catholics, the firm of Edmund Lang and brother, the architects, they were able to deliver a design that um, made the congregation comfortable with, with their heritage. Um, Lang's design for a grand basilica towered over Allentown, not unlike the German cathedrals its congregants had known in Europe. So the Historic Review Commission provided a positive recommendation to city council. Um, they felt that the, the building was historic for under several criteria. The first one is its exemplification of an architectural type, style, or design. Um, and I went into um, a discussion about the German concept of Runbogen still which is a utility building designed for utility. And so I won't, go th I won't go through that in detail each time, but that's certainly the way that this building was des designed. Um, and it was certainly meant to provide a certain feeling about it. Um, but they, they felt that this exemplified that concept. Um, the next criteria that they felt it was significant on was criteria four, which identifies the work of an architect, designer, or engineer. Um, Herman, Herman Lang joined his brother Edmund in a firm, in the firm Edmund Lang and brother after becoming a naturalized citizen of the United States in 1906. Um, eventually the firm was dissolved, but Herman continued his architectural practice in Pittsburgh Southside and Carrick neighborhood until his death in June of 1932. It can be inferred from St. George, St. John Vianney Cemetery, Southside, that Herman was either a member of St. George congregation or was afforded the honor due to his involvement in the design of the church. They felt this property was significant under criteria seven, which is its association with an important cultural or social aspect. The resource is a physical manifestation of the cultural and ethnic, ethnic, ethnic origin of its patrons. Once among the largest groups to settle in the city of Pittsburgh, more than 18% of present day Pittsburghers identify as having German ancestry. But unlike, unlike other distinctly ethnic Pittsburgh neighborhoods like Bloomfield, the Hill District, Squirrel Hill, South Hills, present day Pittsburgh lacks a clearly clearly defined German districts and enclaves that it once had. In the late 19th, early 20th centuries, German communities like Allentown, Deutschtown, Troy Hill, and Bloomfield were clearly identifiable. On arrival in the United States, German Catholics found themselves separated from mainstream Protestant society. As a result, they often huddled together in strong ethnic communities and neighborhoods where they could preserve their own customs and language. Church were obviously the natural places to do this. Um, prior to the Civil War, many churches, including German Catholic churches, were designed by Protestant architects who failed to understand the specific needs of their patrons. Often these buildings were less than ideal, but were accepted by German Catholic congregation in an attempt to adapt to their new country and culture. However, by the late 19th century, many, many immigrant newcomers viewed the loss of their cultural heritage unfavorably. When it came to religious institutions, German immigrants desired German churches built by German architects. Finally, the property is significant under criteria 10 with its unique location and distinctive physical appearance 
or presence in the neighborhood. There, there are exceedingly few buildings in Pittsburgh that can equal the resource and presence of a command site. From nearly any, any vantage point within the community, the building and its twin spires and its blood red brick are predominantly visible. Can you, can you move the photos forward? Is there, I might, I think I might, might have put another one in there. Is it just three? Hi, okay. this is Ann Kramer. Um, th there were only three photos. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, cited, this property is cited at the base of a steep hill. Um, and the way it, sh it, it is the backdrop for these small houses is European yet distinct, distinctively Pittsburgh. So, um, you know, the property has a, a really significant amount of integrity. Right now, I can tell you, it's my understanding that the windows have been boarded up to protect the stained glass. It's all there. Um, so, my recommendation for you all is a positive recommendation to City Council, just like the Historic Review Commission made. So that's, that's what I have for you. Okay, thank you. Good. At this time, we take public testimony. Is there anyone who would like to speak with regards to this application? Uh, yes, we do have hands raised. Okay. Uh, Mark Whitman, you're unmuted, and if you could spell your name for the record, please. Mark, we can't hear you yet, so uh, do you want to speak up again and see if we can hear you? Can you hear me okay? Now we can hear you, yes. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Whitman. Hi, my name is Mark Whitman. I reside at 105 Haverman Avenue in the city of Pittsburgh, 15211. And I am the nominator of this historic structure. I reference the city code <clears throat> that reads, the city planning commission shall consider effects of designation on adjoining properties and surrounding neighborhoods within the framework of established planning, development, and land use objectives for the city of Pittsburgh. And based on that, I would say this designation will have a positive effect on adjoining properties and the surrounding neighborhood because it will protect the structure from improper exterior alterations such as the removal of the stained glass windows that the owner has presently initiated. I've seen this work myself that it was completed in June where the owner retained the services of an abatement contractor, American Contracting Enterprises, who has already completed preparations for the removal of the stained glass windows from inside of the structure. I can provide photos of that work if needed. The designation will also protect this historic structure from possible demolition, which was proposed by the owner. And I do have documentation of that as well. I can confidently state that the HRC had not accept, if the HRC had not accepted my application for historic nomination on June 10th, 2020, that the stained glass windows, which were a part of the exterior of the structure, would have been removed by now. Fortunately, the nomination process has restricted that work from proceeding. I can testify that this edifice is an irrepre irreplaceable structure, a beloved landmark that defines the skyline of Allentown and the surrounding hilltop community. 
For over 100 years, the generous donations of time and talent and dollars by generations of parishioners of modest means were entrusted to construct and maintain this magnificent edifice. I hope that you will allow this beautiful structure to be standing for many years to come and not to be canalized and discarded as planned by the owner. I respectfully ask that you vote to recommend this nomination to city council. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others who would like to speak with regard to this project? Uh, no other hands are raised at this time. Okay, thank you. That closes public testimony. Commissioners, are there questions or comments? Commissioner O'Neill. Yep. I, I just had a quick question. I know uh, Mark Whitman mentioned section 1101.03G and uh, Ms. Quinn also cited some of the historic code. Can we just clarify with staff what the scope of our review is? If that's Sarah or Corey. Well, I mean, I'm here. I mean, what I, what I can tell you is that, you know, what Mr. Whitman quoted in the, in, in his comments right now, that's what you guys should use to make your decision. Um, I present the Historic Review Commission, what they did because, um, because I'm staff for the Historic Review Commission and that's, that's, that's what I use, so. Thank you. And from my perspective, I think we owe them a bit of deference. I'm not a, on the Historic Review Commission and I, I defer a lot to them and I think given the limited scope of 110103G regarding the impact of properties adjoining. Um, I haven't seen any demonstration that this is negative. Um, so thank you, Ms. Quinn. Sure. Other questions or comments from the commission? Okay. Hearing none, do I have a motion that we recommend approval as stated in our reports? So moved. So moved, Commissioner Mingo, second? Second. Second, Commissioner Dietrich. Okay, Commissioner Blackwell? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Dietrich? Aye. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Commissioner Mingo? Aye. Commissioner Mondor? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Aye. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Quinn. Uh, that takes us to item four, which is DCP ZDR 2019-02015, address 1501 Penn Avenue, demolition and new construction, Ms. Rakes. And sorry, quickly before Ms. Rakes starts, I will be recusing because I have a relationship with this project. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, Commission members. Before I do my brief introduction, I just want to check and make sure my applicant team is here and I can hear them. I do see a bunch of folks on. If I could just get a couple of positives that we can hear you, um, maybe from Dusty or Cindy. I'm here, Kate. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Well, I will do my introductions and I, hopefully all the technology will go well. And if not, we'll figure it out. Uh, so this is an application for DCP ZDR 2019-02015, which requires planning commission approval both for the demolition of the existing structure and for the new construction of a new mixed use structure uh, with ground floor retail, office, uh, and parking that's accessory to the building, as well as will be available to the public on evens, evenings and weekends. This is in the Golden Triangle Subdistrict B, and that requires 10% urban open space. The project is providing the majority of the urban open space along Smallman, under a colonnade and in a plaza both above grade. While we appreciate that the applicant has worked to refine the design of this space, and that we 
I acknowledge that there are constraints because of the floodplain. Staff has concerns that the open space as designed does not meet the standard, which is to provide passive recreation space or informal activity areas. We also have concerns about permitted, permitting colonnaded walkways under the building footprint to qualify as urban open space based on what we understand the intent of that section. There may be possible exceptions, but as a general typology, we believe that it is problematic. Colonnades, especially when raised above the abutting sidewalk, can feel more like private open space for users of the building and not necessarily welcoming to the public. The project was reviewed in, by design review staff twice and then by the contextual design advisory panel on December 10th of 2019. Uh, you have with your report, the design review uh, summary letter, I will say briefly that sta uh, staff comments included that activation was needed at the pedestrian realm, including refinement of the urban open space and that the building massing should be appropriately scaled for the neighborhood. CDAP echoed some of the comments on the urban open space and pedestrian realm. The panel complemented the design of the interior programming and parking garage base. However, they had concerns about the lack of detailing on the office tower, especially with the pro project scale and prominent location. The panel underscored the need for the building's design to achieve a level of distinction comparable that to other signature buildings at other significant sites in the city. The applicant has submitted a transportation impact study, which has been reviewed and approved by the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, or DOMI. Uh, DOMI staff will still need to review the final details of the site plan. Stormwater and floodplain both have been submitted and have been approved by staff. Uh, staff is recommending denial on this application without prejudice and encourages the applicant to continue to work on the building and site design and return to the commission. This is based on concerns regarding the project not meeting the zoning code standards for open space and for the following planning commission criteria. First, criteria H relative to scale and architectural relationship. I'm sorry, Kate, criteria H is in uh, Hilo? Uh, yes. And if you could slow down a wee bit, that would be great. Yep. A criteria H relative to scale and architectural relationships. The structure needs a refined, complete design that respects the architectural relationships of the surrounding structures, especially relative to the large mass of the building. Criteria I relative to protection of views and view corridors, including from the riverfront. The applicant has not yet demonstrated how views from the riverfront will be impacted with a significant change to the strip district skyline. And criteria K regarding open space, planning commission raised concerns at briefing about how the space feels narrow and not always obviously welcoming to the public. Uh, so with that introduction, um, I will turn it over to the applicants to make their presentation and just let us know when you uh, need the slides to move forward. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I would like to ask the court reporter to make sure that I get a copy of the transcript. My name is Dusty Elias Kirk. I'm an attorney at Reed Smith, 225 Fifth Avenue, Pittsburgh, PA 15222. Thank you. We've worked together before, so I know <laughs> who you are. Yes, thank you. I'm representing JMC Holdings, 1501 Penn Owner, LLC. And with me today is Matt Casson, one of the founding partners of JMC and one of the partners for this project. Brandon Haw of Haw Brandon Haw Architects is also with me and Zach Cooley of Brandon Hall Haw Architects, Ben Hunter of Langan Engineers and Cindy Jampel of Trans, Trans Associates. That's who you will be hearing testimony from today. So I just wanna give a little background before we start our testimony. JMC began meeting with the city of Pittsburgh before they even purchased this property in 2018. They talked with the prior owner, Jim Woolley, and the previous developers interested in redeveloping this property. And after they purchased 1501 Penn Avenue, they began meeting with the city officials with purpose and in earnest to achieve the best development for this site and the city. So later on, you're going to see a slide that details all of those meetings, but that slide does not even begin to explain the effort that JMC and their development team has put into this high quality project for the city. So we are well aware that planning staff has recommended denial. Uh, what we wanna say is this is an unusual site 
and it is in the GTB zoning district, which has no uh, height limitation and has an FAR, which this project meets. So it's in that transition area between the downtown and the strip district. And you're gonna hear evidence from our architects that it's kind of in a no man's land um, in between the retail walking area of the strip district that we all love and that dense urban area of the downtown. It's an area that's crying out for redevelopment and these developers, JMC, they're really being urban pioneers because they're going to be the first one to build a transition building between the downtown and the strip. So you'll hear that this is also the first building that is in the floodplain as we go to the strip district. And it's also the only building in the floodplain in the GTB zoning district. And in fact, there are very few buildings or sites in the floodplain in the entire Golden Triangle district. So we understand that that has an effect on the design and they, these owners will do everything possible to make it pedestrian friendly. You're gonna hear about that. This also is a concrete building that no one else was able to redesign to use and they found a way to do it. So Cindy Jample of Trans will also talk to you about the des design challenges for the site and how they've overcome that to have parking and working with Domi for two years to get ingress and egress, preserving the 15th Street bike corridor and the 16th Street bridge access. So we are asking that you keep an open mind, that you listen to our evidence and uh, consider the unique characteristics of this site and approve the application. So I'm also asking you to give us an opportunity to rebut or cross-exam witnesses as needed. And I am now going to turn this over to Matt Casson. Thank you, Dusty. Can you hear me okay? Dusty, you can? Good. Thank you, Dusty, and thank you, Commission members, for your time today. As Dusty noted, my name is Matt Casson. I'm the founding partner of JMC, the owner of 1501 Penn Avenue. I thought I would start by sharing our history with the project, which basically dates back to the fourth quarter of 2015, which is when we really started to, as a firm, evaluate and invest in the Pittsburgh market. Um, at that time, myself, my colleagues, we cataloged many buildings in the city of which 1501 Penn was one of them. And that, that market diligence and study actually led to the acquisition of the Pennsylvanian at 1100 Liberty Avenue, which is a building we've spent the last three or so years refurbishing uh, that we still own today and we, we, we intend to own indefinitely. In addition to 1501 Penn Avenue, we also own a few uh, flex industrial properties between downtown and the airport. So in short, we are long-term investors and owners in Pittsburgh, and we certainly will continue to grow our portfolio here. Regarding 1501 Penn Avenue, as Dusty alluded to, it has been a collaboration for us from the start. And while we closed on the purchase in October of 2018, prior to the closing, we began to meet with various stakeholders throughout the city including Ray Gastel and his team at city planning, the mayor's office, councilwoman Deb Gross, strip district neighbors, and leadership at the URA. So it has been very important for us to engage with everyone in the city and the neighborhood to be transparent about our plans and to better understand the various views on what 1501 Penn should and could be. As we've worked on other successful commercial projects throughout the country, we believe that it certainly is the dialogue between the public and the private realm that leads to the best outcomes for both the developer, excuse me, for both the developer and most importantly, the city. Regarding 1501 Penn, as, as some of you I, I gather can imagine, the site does present an interesting set of challenges. And you know, as developers, we therefore went through several iterations of how best to use the site and the structure itself. And while we were hopeful that we could use the existing building in a really meaningful way, uh, the column spacing and, and the thick exterior concrete walls made that pretty impossible for us to do. However, 
and I think Dusty alluded to this, we are very pleased that we can use a portion of the existing foundation as that is a contributing factor in our ability to qualify the project for LEED Gold certification. In addition to LEED Gold, the project will also be well gold rated, both of which show our commitment to ensuring we have a building of the highest quality at this site. One portion of the design I wanna address is the urban open space plan. While we believe we meet the guidelines presented in the code, I wanna emphasize that we really do understand how important the urban open space is to the project. To be totally candid, it is in our best interest to welcome as many pedestrians to the building as we possibly can. As the more people that have access to and are encouraged to visit our retail space and our retail stores and the colonnade, the more successful our retail spaces and overall building will be. Further to this goal, we want this space to be able to be utilized year round. So the design of a slightly elevated colonnade for the retail accomplishes a few things. First, it puts the retail above the floodplain, which is, is a must, otherwise the retail would not be practical nor leasable due to the flood risk. And by having a colonnade, we can protect patrons from the elements during the times of inclement weather that we often experience in Pittsburgh during the winter months. In addition, successful retail is based on foot traffic. So how do we ensure that the public, not just building tenants, are patrons of the retail? We do this through having well-programmed open space with inviting, inviting public seating and opportunities to congregate. We do this through tasteful wayfinding, and we do this by curating a mix of retail tenants that resonate with the general public. From a development perspective, we would be foolish to not make the open space and retail as accessible as possible, as it would be counterintuitive to a successful development. As many of the staff members on this call know, we have worked with the city to change the open space and retail plan several times, the result of which is what you see here today. We are thrilled about being one of the first few buildings in this location to get going and to be a positive narrative for this part of the city and the beginning of the Strip District as it continues to evolve and develop. Last, we do welcome the, the continued collaboration with the city. We are very proud of the design of this building and our appreciation of the design has continued to grow with time. And while commission members have not had the benefit of seeing the design evolve, I believe that its simplicity and scale will be something that, we, that will stand the test of time and something that all Pittsburghers will be proud of. Thank you every, everybody for your time and Dusty, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Matt. Could you please advance to the next slide? And then I'm gonna turn it over to Brandon Ha, the architect. Brandon, are you there? Do we have Brandon? Brandon, you may have to unmute. Click the bottom left. Yes, got it. There got you it. are, Brandon. Okay. So I had a mute problem like previous. Um, so here we are. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, once again. I very much enjoyed last time we had the opportunity to present this project to you. It's always very thought provoking, these sorts of dialogues about architecture, scale and context. So with that said, I will um, go through um, the slides and we've added some information uh, to, um, to address some of the concerns that um, were put into the notice. If we go to the next slide, we see um, how this project is in the Golden Triangle District B. And indeed the project site is one of the just shown there in the corner, is one of the few sites in the whole of the Golden Triangle District B to be within the floodplain. So it's unusual in that sense and doesn't actually present any opportunity uh, for precedence in that sense to be, um, to be a, of concern. The project also, um, is in this Golden Triangle District B that was zoned without any height restrictions. So its intended uses were for high rise office buildings, hotels, apartments, and, and the like for intended uses. 
with an FAR on our particular site of 13, with which we're substantially below that. So the project itself that's before you today is completely as of right in terms of its height, bulk, and massing. We go to the next slide. The immediate context of the Golden Triangle District B coming through to 16th Street, you see um, we have as neighbors the Homewood Suites on the other side of 15th Street, Vision on 15th Street. We also have across Smallman, uh, District 15. And on the other side of 16th Street, we have the new Smallman Street uh, uh, District with the future retail of the office terminal building and the 1600 Smallman Street. On the other side of Penn Avenue, you will notice the existing Buncher property, which is to be developed in the future under the same rules as the Golden Triangle District B. In other words, unfettered in terms of height and bulk and massing in that sense. So the area has been slated for um, increased density of development, taller buildings. And as you will see, it's also promoting this idea that the Smallman Street retail will continue under 16th Street uh, Bridge, the, where it uh, comes across the Allegheny River and hits Penn Avenue. There's an undercroft there. And to draw the life of Smallman Street towards the city um, and the Golden Triangle District B, which is no small feat unto itself in urban terms. The uh, Penn Avenue retail the blue line on this slide, where the honky tonk district is that was alluded to last time we met, sort of peters out at around 17th, uh, not, not least largely because of the lack of retail and the lack of um, activity from that, that um, cross street forward to the uh, city, the downtown district. If we go to the next slide, We think about context and we think about massing and character. And these slides for me were very instructive to see how you wonder what kind of context we actually have just here. As Dusty said, it's a transition site. And it being a transition site, um, the idea of density and creating streets is what's important. Here in these slides, the Buncher property the 16th Street Bridge where the vacant gaucho is, the uh, District 15 office, the uh, site across the street from the outside on, is a parking lot. So you see a lot of tarmac. And I firmly believe in urban terms that seats require, cities require density, that you need, and I will speak further into this presentation about the street wall height and the idea that streets are what makes cities, not the buildings, not their high rise buildings above this cornice line of six or seven stories, but what happens at the street line in urban terms. So with site and uh, context and massing and character, you know, this is the site and the character and massing that this transition building has to deal with. We go to the next slide. And this is the existing Wally building uh, shown looking towards uh, downtown along Penn Avenue. You see how the current situation is a derelict site. The project as Matt um, alluded to has very heavy uh, concrete structure. The walls are actually, the exterior walls are actually part of the stability frame for the building. So you can't knock out many windows in those, uh, those heavy concrete walls. The structure itself is a, hollow, uh, a closely um, distanced column grid, a very heavy structure. So very difficult to reuse. It's no longer extant for its original use. And more to the point in terms of urbanism and street life, there is no street life. The, the, the streets are dark. They're um, unoccupied and unactivated. 
in its current form. If we go to the next slide, the first sketches for this project, we actually did study the, um, the sort of mass and form of the Wally building. We noticed its vertical pilasters, um, the way the cornice line fits into the scale of the surroundings. And we thought, well, you know, if we're going to eventually have to um, replace this structure because it cannot be used for other uses, um, we can at least create some memory in terms of form, height, massing, and context. So these sketches very early on in the project started to allude to that verticality, the pilasters, but in a new and contemporary way, it started to allude to the cornice line and the height and bulk of the existing building as a, if you like, a sort of memory of that scale and massing of the building. And then with the office accommodation to separate that out and have it sort of hovering above this cornice line, the mass of the building in a very uh, refined and discreet manner um, to be a polite neighbor, if you like, this transition building between the two worlds of the Strip District and the Golden Triangle. We go to the next slide. Those were some of the uh, influences. And here now you see how the um, downtown district in the distance with its 64 and 27 and 30 story high buildings run through into the uh, GTB district here, which our site is part of. You see in the foreground, the, um, the building which is 10 floors high, the, um, the uh, Penrose building. And then um, you see also the, the way the 16th Street Bridge comes through and the base of the building with its green roof in the foreground. And the office tower floating above that in a very discreet and very minimal way, uh, a good neighbor awaiting the future developments that will come to the whole district and knit together the city and create that transition between the strip district and downtown. We go to the next. Some of the context, the other side, this is a view from the 16th Street Bridge, looking back towards 1600 Smallman Street with the Penrose building 10 stories just to the uh, top right of this slide. And this is very much the immediate context, the other side of 16th Street. And we've chosen, you know, looking at this building, which is very handsome, the horizontality of the brick spandrel panels, the coloration of the terracotta, the large industrial windows that run through. And so as a, as a memory, if you like, or, or a contextual response to these very large blocky buildings, the industrial blocks of the strip district and how we use that sort of blockiness, if I can use a, a term like that, as the response to this new transition building. We go to the next. And so when we think about cities, whether it's Paris or London or Barcelona or Madrid or even New York and Pittsburgh, whenever I talk about cities or New York particularly, it's not a city of towers, it's a city of streets. The, the life of a city is, um, is made at the street level. And that cornice line I spoke about before is all important. So a contributory building to the strip district, a transition building that makes the transition to the downtown district, the commercial buildings. Here you see the way we're taking the existing form, bulk and massing of the Wally building and translating it to a new structure with horizontal floor slabs, which I'll come on to later. Um, with the verticality, the memory of those piers running around, and then creating a building that's separated above, that's almost like a background building, refined, elegant, a good neighbor, that won't shout from the rooftops, it won't be a walkie-talkie, it doesn't pretend to be a building that is going to not stand the test of time and become an elegantly refined classic um, over time, with a, an intelligent use of of valuable resources, which I'll come on to later. So really the thesis is our, our experience of a building such as this is at the street level and what it does for the community at large. 
Let's go to the next. We've, as Matt and Dusty have said, we've had many, many meetings <clears throat> throughout the course of the design of this project with all sorts of stakeholders from the Strip District neighbors to CDAP. And during the 10th of December meeting with CDAP, we did many uh, adjustments to the design, uh, amongst which we refined the parking access, which we did with many conversations with Domi to ensure that many, um, of, there's a lot of public access to the parking from Penn Avenue and the leaseholders will use the 16th street access to the parking, uh, which is on the uh, side underneath the uh, 16th street bridge as it comes in. So a very discreet use of that space for parking ac access, but also allowing um, minimized access on Penn Avenue because two uh, routes of access as Cindy will talk about are better than one in terms of traffic management. We redesigned the plaza and the colonnade um, at the urging of staff at CDAP um, which I'll come on to later. We replaced a raised plaza that we had designed to open it up to 16th Street to draw the activity of Smallman Street uh, through from 1600 and the terminal building under the 16th Street flyover uh, through to the Smallman Street retail that we'll talk about in a moment. Providing redesigned ADA ramps sensitively built into the landscaping with planting and the 15th Street ADA access at the other end. All raised up as I'll come on to because we are unusually in the floodplain. So um, another measure that we introduced was to increase the separation of the tower from the parking podium. So again, hovering the building above, we increased that uh, separation by more than seven feet from 14 feet up to 21 feet. We added the curved facade or accentuated, we brought it back further into the building to accentuate that separation of architectural massing uh, from the two buildings. And we refined the articulation and the proportion of the tower cladding, uh, creating more shadow line and in the horizontal metal spandrels that are designed to create a counterpoint, a minimal counterpoint to the, uh, to the verticality of the base in terms of a architectural composition. We created more convertible parking levels. I mentioned the horizontality of the parking levels being very important. So you don't see these sloped facades. Um, we see a fully clad parking structure that will glow and have a life, um, has high quality materials, it's naturally ventilated. And, and with those horizontal uh, lines of structure, at the upper two levels, we are anticipating adaptive reuse for the time that perhaps parking use is reduced, um, particularly as the strip district gets further developed with uh, more residential develops, developments, particularly down towards the river, that we'll come on to later, that people will start bicycling will uh, walk to work even. And so perhaps in the future, we'll see less car use. So the upper two levels are increased to 13 foot floor to floor. So those floors can be converted in the future. We increase the transparency of the ground floor substantially all the way around. So not only along Smallman Street, but along 15th Street and along Penn Avenue. We increase the height of the Penn Avenue retail, which we'll see in a moment. And we improve the landscape and the design of the urban open space along the colonnade, encouraging passive recreation, as Matt uh, alluded to. We're very conscious and we, we enjoy the dialogue with CDAP. We've enjoyed the dialogue with the city to really truly make this a public passive recreation space in all manner of forms and due to the uh, very specific conditions of this site. So let's go to the next slide. Here you see a view uh, from around 18th Street looking back towards the city. You see the nature of this transition. The terracotta color, the steel um, references to uh, Pittsburgh as a steel town and yet also playing into the brick of the uh, strip district that is extant in the old 
uh, industrial buildings. So creating a sort of transition of architectural form between the two neighborhoods, nonetheless maintaining that cornice line, you see the uh, palm building in the, in the foreground, 10 stories, the cornice line of the existing Wally building at the base for the parking structure, the separation of the amenity level with its green roof, and then beyond that, the office towers very discreetly, very politely uh, creating a scale transition in a, in a quiet way. It's not trying to shout at all, as I mentioned. It's, it's to be a polite and sober and intelligently uh, proportioned neighbor to the strip district. And that's by design. If we go to the next slide, we see now the Homewood Suites in the foreground. This is looking down Smallman Street. And you see again the cornice line running through to 1600 uh, Smallman Street all the way through to the end where Smallman Street ends on the other side of 16th Street, creating that contextual bridge between the Strip District and the uh, Golden Triangle District of which this is a part. Let's go to the next slide. And now you see a, a slide looking from the new terminal building on the right, 1600 Smallman Street on the left, the horizontality of sight line, particularly the one from the terminal building, subliminally picked up in the design of the office towers above with the same coloration of the brick in the spandrel of the building itself. Um, here we're using a, a, a metal cladding system, again evoking the sort of steel, um, the, you know, reference to the steel in the downtown district, but nonetheless tying back through color, not only steel, but also the coloration of the strip district. And again, that scale line of the cornice line. And you'll also notice in this slide, the raised, the raised um, retail areas with the covered walkways. This is very much part of the character of Smallman Street today and in the future. And to draw this character towards the city and enhance this public realm under a flyover, under a bridge, is something very difficult to do urbanistically. And I believe we've taken all of the measures working closely with CDAP and taking on board a lot of their suggestions in a, in a very open and welcome way, we've, we've achieved, I think, and we will continue to achieve that continuity of urban context, which is so important to the uh, well being of the community, the well being of the strip district, and the well being of the city of Pittsburgh in general. Let's go to the next slide. We were asked to provide a um, a slide of uh, the building from the river to see how it affects the sight lines. And of course, this is the first building in the uh, Golden Triangle District to be built with this new massing. In fact, with, a, with an increased FAR, uh, this building could be another five stories taller and the car parking could be an, another two to three stories taller. We've kept the scale to the existing Wally building. We've created a very discreet and refined and well-mannered building above that separated out. And don't forget that a lot of the sites around this have not yet been developed. They could go to eight stories in the foreground. There is new ruling, which is very welcome not to have uh, on uh, grade car parking. Uh, so less tarmac and more buildings, which creates that urban density, which is so welcome to making true cities with true urban streets. And of course, I mentioned the Buncher site to be developed that's part of the Golden Triangle subsection B uh, district that will be developed. We don't know what the development will be, but again, it's going to add density to well, well, um, well received density, which is why it was zoned in this way to create this transition um, between the strip district and the downtown area. So we need to look at this building in that context. And 
you know, having, as you could probably tell, I'm English and knowing London and knowing the London skyline with every single new building shouting, uh, hey, look at me, you know, one could argue, well, what, at what point do buildings become over exuberant? At what point does, does a quiet politeness actually um, carry the day of future proofing the way we build our cities? And not every building has to be a landmark. Usually landmarks are for the public buildings, the churches, the museums, the government buildings. And so it's not to say that architecture shouldn't also uh, create great uh, edifices, but this is a very particular building in terms of its uh, raw, raw resources that are used and the context that it's in. And I'll come on to that in a moment. So let's go to the next slide. Just some facts and figures, as I mentioned, we're some 26% below the allowable FAR for the district. Um, that's 13 FAR, we're now at 9.63 project FAR. And then when we look at the um, urban open space, which is part of the discussion for today, um, we are actually providing uh, a greater amount of area than the required 10%. And in fact, if we included all of the open area, uh, as is shown in the um, little diagram on the bottom right of this slide, we would be almost a thousand, well, we're actually 740 uh, square feet more than what is required. But we're only including the colonnade and the uh, 16th Street Plaza um, for this uh, required open area. Uh, for this application. So let's go to the next slide. Here's some uh, sort of basic uh, facts and figures for the retail, which is one level. You see that the retail is raised um, as you saw in the slide of Smallman Street, the terminal building and the 16th, uh, 1600 uh, building. The raised platform is there because of the floodplain of which this building is part of. You also then, so that's the retail. Then you have the seven levels of parking with the two upper floors convertible. You have the amenity level with its green roof contributing to water retention as part of the gold lead and also uh, just good uh, practice for city making. And then the 12 office floors above that. And then another green roof at the top of the building again, maximizing the uh, water retention of the entire uh, roofscape of the building. And we'll hear from Ben Hunter about the water retention procedures which have been approved for the project and the importance of that uh, later in the presentation. Let's go to the next. Just to take you through the uh, ground floor, you see the uh, starting the bottom uh, right, we have the loading entry exit. We're bringing trucks in off of the street. So no truck maneuvering on Penn Avenue. They're brought into the building and maneuver within the curtilage of the building. Then we have a double height bike cafe retail uh, on Penn Avenue, taking up nearly 50% of the frontage of the street. And then we have the um, public, publicly accessible parking entry exit uh, space, 27 feet wide, next to the double height bike and parking uh, uh, bike cafe. And then as we turn the corner onto 15th Street, which is an important bike route down to the riverfront and to the new bike lane that's going to be built along Smallman Street, we have uh, a bike room with more than 122 uh, bikes within it, which is glass clad. Um, so it will glow at night and is a, a very beautifully de designed uh, facility uh, in the belief that if something is well designed, it will be more used. And then further down, we walk down the bike path and down 15th street, the changing level is something like nine feet. We have at the corner of 15th street and Smallman street, a drop-off zone dedicated that could be for Uber or Lyft or ADA um, vehicles to drop people off to the ADA ramp, which you see on the corner of 
um, Smallman and 15th Street. I forgot to mention that all the blue lines here are referring to the ADA uh, accessible, accessibility measures that we've been very concentrated to uh, work for in this project. It's very important to us as architects. So curb cuts, the ADA parking is very convenient um, off of Penn Avenue. See that in blue in the center of the plan with immediate access to the lobby um, for, the, um, for the building. Then we uh, turn the corner from 15th Street to Smallman Street and you see the raised colonnade uh, above the floodplain. And that is uh, required and necessary for the retail, which as I said before, is continuing the retail corridor down Smallman Street from the terminal building and 1600 uh, Smallman Street. And if you can just imagine for one moment that retail not being set back, not creating a raised uh, landscaped uh, public open space and, and coming all the way to the property line, that retail and that uh, piece of the uh, sidewalk would not be activated. And why do I say that? Well, it wouldn't be activated for the city purely because it's above the floodplain and the sidewalk isn't. So you wouldn't be able to get to the retail, which is already seen as a positive move. We have retail on Penn, we have retail on Smallman, and we have a bike lane on 15th Street. So by pulling the retail back, as happens elsewhere all the way down Smallman Street, there's a new language, a new language of open, open public space, which is raised above the floodplain. And we've been working with CDAP and working with the city to create these uh, colonnaded spaces, both wide and tall and very generous in proportion. And as we all know, colonnades throughout the history of architecture have been places urbanistically for congregation, for sitting, for being protected from the rain or the snow or from the sun, uh, to have a coffee, to charge a phone, to play a game of chess. So colonnades are valuable pieces of the urban public realm. Um, and history shows us that. And this is a very particular site, as I mentioned, because it's the only one in the floodplain as part of the uh, Golden Triangle District zoning. But nonetheless, we're using the language which is being adopted on Smallman Street because we are in the floodplain. So let's go, and then all the way at the end on 16th Street, we see the plaza, which is opened up again with the uh, gentle uh, ADA ramp that comes up through the steps with trees either side, um, opening up to 16th Street, a very difficult corner because we're just next to the urban flyover from uh, the bridge at that point and, and trying to make that connection in a public way, a publicly accessible way to 1600 and the terminal building beyond. Let's go to the next. And these are just some um, simple diagrams to show how the um, ADA ramp is engaged on the plaza at 16th Street and Smallman with these uh, steps with trees planted uh, up to the retail area that can spill out and create life within that plaza. And then on the other side, we see the um, the one in 12 ramp where the slope of the site has come down from Penn Avenue to uh, Smallman Street is a very short ramp, very gentle ramp with landscaping that brings people up onto that colonnade space in a very natural way. Everybody comes from uh, the corner of 15th Street and Smallman in the same way for ADA and for able-bodied people to the, to the walkway. Let's go to the next slide. And working with um, Kate and uh, Corey um, with CDAP, uh, who very much encouraged us to work with this idea of the bleacher seating, which softens the edge between the upper level and the lower level. And this, of course, is in an area where 
the um, existing foundations uh, we're not using the, the existing foundations in quite the same way at this particular point of the building. And so we can, um, we can drop these bleacher seating down for um, about a third of the length of Smallman, just over a third of the length of Smallman to activate that public. And of course, those bleacher seats turn the corner and create the transition between the 16th Street Plaza and the bleacher seating as we move forward. Uh, to a long smallman towards 15th Street. If we go to the next slide, you now see uh, two other examples, again, 1600 Smallman Street and the terminal building, where those sorts of moves are created because of the floodplain. Um, and you see the, the way the public uh, is activated at these upper levels. So this will become a familiar urban form once the whole of Smallman Street is, uh, is uh, completed. Let's go to the next slide. And here we have once again a view uh, from the terminal building in 1600 looking towards the uh, 16th Street Bridge coming in and the 1501 building just the other side of the 16th Street Bridge. Again, you see the scale of the cornice line running through, maintaining that character of scale and massing of the old Wally building that was there before, and also the scale and massing and solidity of the old industrial buildings we see before us here. And that, that subtle nod of the horizontality here in this view, uh, thrown or, or exhibited in the office tower that's floating above the base of the building. And here you see again, in very clear terms, those raised sidewalks. In the foreground on 1600 indeed, the ADA ramp is actually cutting off the existing sidewalk from the uh, retail activity above. This is something that we were at great pains to, to um, avoid in the design of the public open space by integrating the ramp in, in a way um, for the 16th Street Plaza with the steps um, so that we do engage with the sidewalk as much as possible and activate and encourage the public up onto the raised platform. So let's go to the next slide. And this is moving along now to the remaining half of, uh, of um, Smallman Street, where the um, colonnaded space opens out the existing foundations, the columns fall on the existing foundations, which is contributing to the lead points. And it's interesting to note some statistics. There would be 30 million pounds of concrete saved at 7,000 tons uh, of concrete, um, which is um, the equivalent of 400 trucks is saved by keeping the existing foundation, 400 trucks of concrete. So all of that uh, carbon footprint, um, which is contributing to the lead and what I said about the intelligent use of resources, which I'll come back to, um, by keeping not only this out of the flood, floodplain, but also killing two birds with one stone and, and keeping existing foundations for the construction of of this new building. As you see in the, um, in the diagram, it's 14 foot, uh, four inches wide. It enables lots of circulation space, very generous. Uh, it's 14 feet high and the planting is very uh, translucent. We'll use wires uh, for the uh, balustrade and allow you know, jasmines and other plants to grow over those, but creating a sort of green connectivity uh, with transparency through between the two, two realms. And uh, if we go to the next slide, we see some examples of the, the planting, particularly the one on the left, which is an old in, reused industrial building in Portland. Um, again, with the jasmine growing with the wired balustrades is very much the sort of character. This is a much more narrow and uh, less tall space than the one that we're suggesting. If we go to the next slide, you see here 
the opportunities and, and we're going to be providing public seating, publicly accessible seating, perhaps with uh, chess tables um, and uh, this degree of transparency that we've worked on even since our last meeting. Um, and we will continue the dialogue to create this transparency uh, so that the lower level is linked to the upper level um, so that people really do feel that it's their space. The bleacher seating and moving up at 16th Street, moving from 15th Street down away from the sun or the rain or the snow uh, will create the animation of this space. People will want to be there like they want to be in colonnades in many of the cities that I mentioned uh, previously. Let's go to the next slide. And this idea of passive recreation, you know, the, the idea that chess clubs could congregate there at the weekend, the seating is going to be provided, it's loose furniture, um, so that people can move around, charge a phone, work outside if necessary, uh, get some fresh air, um, meet a friend for lunch, um, all of these activities, uh, or just simply people watching, reading a book outside, of, away from the rain, um, this is the sort of character of space that we are seeking to create and work with staff and the city to improve in any which way we can um, in a collective way. As Matt said, the, um, the, uh, the holding of hands between the public realm and public interest and the private realm and private interests, this is where they come together. And we as designers uh, work in between that world of the public realm and the private, our clients, to make that fusion happen. And this is what we're seeking to do with this project. Let's go to the next slide. So now you see the full extent of the Smallman Street elevation. It is abundant glazing, uh, turning the corners of 15th Street, turning the corner of, 17th, of 16th Street, the plaza on the left-hand side of this slide, 15th Street, on the right hand side of this slide. And there you see the trees that will be, part, that will be planted as part of the development and the uh, street <coughs> bicycle parking as well. And the bleacher seating coming up to close to where the uh, entrance to the building is. Um, and there you see where we uh, are using the uh, existing foundations and keeping everything out of the floodplain. Let's go to the next slide. And this is the corner of 15th Street and Smallman Street. And here again, you see the planting, the transparency to the retail. Previously, this uh, corner on uh, 15th Street as it came down the hill uh, was solid. And we only had the glazing along Smallman. And in discussions with CDAP, we changed the design, we opened up the corner, provided more glazing on 15th Street. You see the ramp uh, moving up onto the colonnade just there on the corner. And you see on the right hand of this slide, you see the drop off conveniently located for access uh, across the bike lane, which is coming down to create the path to both Smallman Street and all the way down 15th Street to the riverfront walk and cycle path down there. We also, you'll notice in terms of massing, we've cut back the corners. And this also contributes to the breaking down of scale at the street level uh, by indenting the corners for each of and every corner of the building. Again, to create that uh, street life, to give the interest at the street life um, and the building, you know, we all live and work in cities and we walk around cities. You know, rarely are we walk it, looking up beyond the sixth floor. Um, it's only when we get distant that we really recognize the buildings that are around us that are taller. And this is very much the thesis of this building to create a street life for the city and for the uh, community that is enlivening and enriching uh, with commerce and activity uh, a site which is currently um, past its original uses as a ice storage and create a new uh, and vibrant street life for the community. 
Let's move to the next slide and you'll see the elevation now, the changing level down to the floodplain on the left-hand side where the colonnade, the raised colonnade is there. Um, as I mentioned, if that raised colonnade wasn't there, the street would be less activated because you wouldn't be able to get to that retail in the same way. Or indeed, you wouldn't even be able to get to the uh, entrance to the building in the same way. If we go to the uh, corner of Penn Avenue and the um, 15th Street, there you see a glazed, a translucent glazed wall on the right hand, which is where the bike room is, 122 bike parking spaces for the inhabitants of the building beyond what is required. It's going to be light filled. It will have bicycle maintenance facilities in the belief that um, particularly even more so in the post COVID world, that bike usage is something to be encouraged. Uh, bike usage is a greener form of transport. And if the facilities are good, instead of dingy places that you find in basements that are ill, ill conceived and ill designed, this is a light filled, well designed bike room where uh, it will encourage more building users to uh, use the biking facilities. And indeed, we've spoken about having a bike club within the building um, where like minded individuals can start to uh, be connected uh, for. Uh, bike runs out at the weekends, um, training runs early morning and, and meet up here um, before going to work. So this is very much part of the culture of the building and also because this is a very important hub for the bike path from downtown through the Golden Triangle District to along Penn Avenue. And it, you'll see in a moment how that switches down this very street to Smallman Street. So it makes sense to have this very important bike room on this corner. If we go to the next slide, as we turn the corner along Penn Avenue, as you saw in plan, um, here we have the double height bike uh, cafe or retail space where people can congregate, the community can congregate for at the weekends, get a puncher uh, mended, buy a bike, uh, buy a new wheel or a saddle. And at the same time, it will have, that's why we call it a bike cafe, coffee and juice facilities. So a uh, bike club can meet here, congregate at the weekends or evenings or early morning, uh, grab a juice, grab a coffee after a ride, meet up for a ride at the weekend. And that is prominently placed in the center of the Penn Avenue uh, streetscape as a community facility, as much as a, a retail. Um, facility. And this will be um, in discussions with our client, we're looking at ways to subsidize this space um, so that it really does become uh, something that bikers can utilize as a, a sort of almost like a non-profit uh, uh, address for the community. To the right of that, you see the loading bay entrance, uh, which will have warning signals for when the garage doors go up and any movement takes place, similarly to the parking entry that Cindy will talk about a little later on in the presentation. Let's go to the next. And here we have a view of that double height bike bar um, activated for the community and inside the way the double height can be utilized and uh, with the bar and the shop and the store as, as a hub for everybody, not just building users. Let's go to the next. And again, just to re-emphasize the importance of the bike route, this was the Pittsburgh Strip District Mobility and Network Parking Study that was undertaken by Stantec that really uh, highlights that move towards um, the recommended route along Smallman Street shown in yellow on the slide and the existing bike lane coming from the Golden Triangle shown in red. And importantly, 15th Street our site as the route down to the green um, uh, walkway along the Allegheny, Allegheny River and also um, and, and that routing on 15th Street being so important. Let's go to the next slide. Matt mentioned the importance of the um, being well certified 
and also um, LEED Gold certified. And this is a very uh, important part of the project. Um, we're reducing the energy consumption. We're using active chilled beams, something that's been used in Europe uh, on many occasions and many buildings that I've been involved with. Um, it's now becoming in climates such as Pittsburgh, uh, something that is being adopted. It's a healthier system. We'll see more of uh, chilled beam systems being adopted, I'm sure, after, after COVID. Um, it doesn't allow for, um, or it doesn't rely on forced air systems, uh, but water systems, which are much more energy efficient. Um, we're reducing water consumption, uh, low uh, flow fixtures, water monitoring systems, particularly important with well, uh, again, once again, uh, in the post COVID world, improved air quality um, with the chilled beam systems and also air quality uh, measuring, which is part of the well uh, gold certification and smart material use. I mentioned the uh, reduction in carbon footprint of the concrete by using the existing foundations, but also in the cladding systems, we're reducing the, the amount of aluminum used uh, in the building by concentrating on high performance glazing, 10 foot high uh, glazing panels, um, reducing the amount of aluminum with an economy of means which are um, made possible by the system. So it's the intelligent integration of both the building systems and the cladding systems in the building of the office tower um, that have given rise to this very minimal uh, economy of means because the systems are integrated. The chilled beam, the cladding system, reducing the carbon footprint to create this very elegant and uh, refined response to the architecture of the building. And then finally, the uh, stormwater management. I mentioned the green roofs and the reduction of, uh, of the um, use of water, retention of water um, is a very important part of any city making these days. And we'll go to the next slide. And this is the extent of that roof. And Ben will talk um, of Langen a little bit more about the uh, program for water retention and other water measures in the project, um, which, uh, as was uh, mentioned by Kate, have been approved um, already. So let's go to the next slide. And this is a picture of that green roof as an amenity for the building. You see the separation of the building below and the building above. Let's go to the next. We were asked to uh, provide further detail of the uh, cladding systems that are um, envisaged for the building. Uh, this would be, for example, the cladding of the uh, car parking structure. You'll notice that we've created a double height uh, form, um, creating a, a sense of uh, reduced scale of the base of the building by having two floors uh, ex um, expressed with a perforated metal panel in the sort of terracotta brick color um, that we find in the strip district. Um, the uh, material is uh, perforated. We have the um, indented as opposed to uh, uh, ex extending pilasters. We have an indent, which is sky blue the whole structure is enabling the air to move through uh, for natural ventilation of the car park itself. If we go to the next slide, you see um, from the first slide, the very elegant, high quality detailing that we'll bring to the project, um, the reduced uh, level of aluminum and detailing. <clears throat> we worked with um, CDAP at the very beginning uh, to uh, add some modeling and depth to this uh, spandrel panel. Excuse me, I'll just take a little swig of water. And um, <clears throat> very much a, 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 a proportional uh, concern uh, about how the uh, proportions of the materials would work on the skyline, the shadow line, of the two protrusions, uh, creating a very subtle uh, ribboning effect 
to the horizontality. And then finally, you just see the channel glass at the ground floor that's going to be used for the, um, for the uh, bike parking area. And all of the glazing are neutral uh, coloration. It's not blue tinted, it's not uh, bronze tinted in any form, but as neutral as we can make it, um, but with a high performance uh, coating. We go to the next slide. <clears throat> and there you see the juxtaposition of the two, the base of the building to the cornice line, the setback of the amenity floor with its setback curve glazing um, that, that creates that separation between the vertical and the horizontal. All in this uh, steel, rusty steel or terracotta brown, creating the color uh, context and the bulk and massing context of the, of the blocks um, put together in, a, in an elegant and well-considered composition. Let's go to the next. Now we have a view that's been updated since we last spoke indeed um, with the uh, bleacher seating on the bottom right coming down, seeing that connectivity for the, a substantial length of Smallman Street. And then we transition into the raised colonnade where we have the existing foundations um, utilized, uh, raised because of the floodplain, as I mentioned before, and continuing the language from the other side of the 16th Street Bridge along Smallman Street. We go to the next slide. We see um, a detail of that bleacher seating as it transitions on the right hand side to the um, wire balustrade. It gets wider at that point to the 14 foot dimension that I mentioned. Um, people are already moving up through the space. You see the bicycle parking for public um, on the street and the new trees that will be planted as part of the urban infrastructure of the public space along Smallman Street and the, and the reactivation of a street which is currently dead and derelict. Let's go to the next slide. And this is a view, uh, just to illustrate, I mentioned before the way the building would glow. We've been working with our specialist lighting consultant to uh, balance the lighting level from within so that at night there's this very subtle glow that will um, illuminate those powder blue areas as opposed to the um, brown areas and differentiate the two um, and also that just make, make it seem that it's not a dead um, dark structure but it has this gentle glowing um, activity within and then the retail um, activated and lit as retail uh, can only be um, to really encourage in the winter time and 4 p.m. when the evenings are dark, a warm and inviting uh, place to be. Let's go to the next. We've worked um, a lot with uh, our construction managers on how to minimize the construction traffic during the construction of the project and that leads into the 400 trucks of concrete that is saved by, um, by uh, using the existing foundations. The impact on the local community has been um, something that we've very much been concerned about. And this is just a part of that construction plan and we'll continue to work with the city to refine this as the project moves forward. Let's go to the next slide and just Finally, to recap the um, parking convertibility, the two upper levels uh, anticipating adaptive reuse of the parking in the future by creating this taller floor to floor height of 13 feet. Um, and there you see the step of the, of the uh, site uh, from Penn Avenue down to um, Smallman Street in this section, substantial change in elevation and the way the foundations can be used, as well as creating that colonnade, which is above the floodplain. Um, I'll now um, hand back to, if we go to the next slide, um, I'm going to hand back to Dusty um, for any uh, closing remarks on the architectural section. Thank you.
Can we go back to the slide right before this one, Brandon? Okay. So um, you stated that two levels are convertible. And was this one of the requests of CDAP? Oh yes, it, it, it certainly was. It was part of the conversation. I mean, we're, we're, um, we're finding increasingly when we're doing parking structures around the world now, um, that this is increasingly becoming um, something that gets talked about. And CDAP encouraged this and suggested this. And uh, is it anticipated that the, this uh, parking will have uses other than for the tenants? Yes, again, uh, speaking with Domi and Cindy can speak to this in a moment. Uh, many meetings were, were had and um, a very successful conclusion was uh, come to where um, Penn Avenue entrance would be available uh, to uh, the general public um, at weekends and, and at various hours of the day. Can we also take you back to slide 38, please? Um, I'm not controlling the slides, so slide 38 would be, let me see, rendering of the transition from podium to upper floors. There we go. This one, yes. Yes, so you had talked about the inset and the amenities, and could you tell us how you adapted this based on feedback from CDAP? Well, yes, I mean, we always intended this to be a separation zone, the, the, uh, the green roof being part of the amenity level and the amenities for the building um, at this level as well. Um, <clears throat> but the um, CDAP, in, in conjunction with CDAP, we agreed to, uh, uh, to uh, raise the height of this. So it's now a 21 foot high uh, separation, whereas before we were more like 14 feet, so a substantial increase. And we welcome that suggestion because um, I think it, it helps to separate this thesis, which I've been uh, talking about, the separation of the building that you perceive above the cornice line and the building which you perceive as part of the street life of the neighborhood. Did they also talk about the facade and how it might be less angular. Yes, we we um, had meetings about the uh, the facade and the depth of the spandrel panel. We had it thinner before, and we increased the depth to create more um, horizontality and also the more solidity and more color um, as a result of that. So even though we still have the ten foot high glass and the very tall uh, floor to ceilings, which I forgot to mention. Uh, for the building, for the new tenants that will come to this, uh, you know, increasing the, increasingly the demand for office space such as this in districts such as this um, commercially is for tall, flexible office space. And so we have these taller floor to ceiling heights. We have these taller panes of glass um, and we actually had them even taller, uh, but we revised that down to create these uh, thicker spandrel panels with the modeling, you see the way the uh, light will pick up the shadow line uh, at various different times of day and, and light to refraction. Thank you. Can we go back to slide 23? That's the colonnade. Right, that's right. Dusty, this is Ann Kramer. Is this the slide that you wanted? Um, I think it's, Ann, I think it's one before this. Well, let's see, what number is that? Uh, there. Um, maybe the diagram, I think. Yeah, maybe the diagram would be better. So it's further back. There you yeah. go. There you go. So I think you, you talked about a nine foot drop. So could you just explain what you mean by that? Well, the, the, the drop of uh, street level between Penn Avenue down to Smallman brings Smallman Street into the floodplain zone. 
And so we need to raise the sidewalk or at least the retail um, to uh, take account of the floodplain. And we are the only building um, or one of the few uh, buildings in the Golden Triangle District that is part of the floodplain. And whereas other buildings in the uh, Strip District are in the floodplain, they have also raised their, uh, their colonnade or setback sidewalks above the street level, as we see in many cities around the world. Uh, Miami is a, a great example. So here we need to uh, raise the retail level above the sidewalk. And this illustrates my point quite well. If you imagine the retail coming all the way to the um, existing uh, sidewalk, you wouldn't be able to enter the retail um, because it's above the floodplain. So, you know, we're activating the, um, the, the, the raised sidewalk in the, in the same way that other examples are activated along Smallman Street. Um, and we're making it this wide uh, to um, create that public space. It's wide enough for people to circulate and also have seating in an ad hoc manner all the way down through that colonnade. And also, as I keep mentioning, very important, the reduction of the carbon footprint of the building by using the existing foundations. But your question relates to the drop in level, which is some nine feet, as I showed in that section, um, previously with the car parking um, between Penn Avenue and Smallman Street that brings us into the floodplain. And has um, ownership talked about um, incorporating signage and lightings regarding this being open during? Yes, well, this is part of the um, wayfinding. Um, this will be publicly accessible um, throughout the day will be signage to, uh, to indicate in a subtle way that this is um, publicly accessible space. But I also just think in a natural way, the 16th Street Plaza, the bleacher seating will already bring people up into that zone very, very naturally. So it's only a matter of public behavior to um, find a place place to sit. If I don't want to sit on the bleacher seating, but I want to sit and have a chat or eat my lunch, I will walk down the colonnade and sit in the, in the public uh, seats that are provided by the estate, by, by our clients. And as Matt said, it's in his interest to create as much uh, public um, activity in this realm as possible. And indeed, we've committed to working with the city, we'll enjoy working with the city to improve and make take what measures um, in the collective and collaborative way that are necessary to improve what we have before us today. Thank you, Brandon. Can we go to slide 18? And I'd like to have Ben Hunter testify. If we could, this is the court reporter. If we're gonna go into a new speaker, we've been going about two hours, so it would be a good time for a break. I have no problem if the commission does not. Yeah, let's take a 10 minute break and reconvene at 25 after four. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
All right, commissioners and applicants, as you uh, come back in, please turn your cameras back on and let's uh, see who's here. All right. Let's see, who are we missing? Okay, so uh, I think we have our commissioners here. So uh, you can uh, begin where you left off, please. Uh, Chair Monder, I want to check with one thing since the, the pace is very slow here. If our court reporter, how, you know, if we're, we're going to run into losing people um, at 4 30, how people's day looks. And also to my fellow commissioners. Mm -hmm. um, I would ask that the uh, applicant move on with the completion of, I know you have more people to speak and we need public testimony and we need questions, so. We're moving. So we need uh, Ben Hunter from Langen Engineers on slide 18 and then we'll go to slide 33. Hi, ben. good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, commission members. I'll be uh, very quick with my items. I just wanna point out a few items that I think would be helpful uh, for this project. Looking at the plan, I'm going to describe what the floodplain's doing. It's not shown on this plan, but I, th I think it's going to be pretty easily understood. So the floodplain for this project basically starts at the corner of Smallman and 15th Street, which is the upper left-hand corner of this site. And it runs just slightly inside the site along Smallman and traverses over to the intersection of Mulberry and 16th Street, which is about halfway through the site uh, or most way through the site on the right hand side. Um, as previously mentioned, as a result of the site being within the floodplain along Smallman Street, it was necessary to raise the colonnade and the retail frontage, also known as occupied space, uh, to meet the floodplain requirements. The as previously mentioned as well, uh, the floodplain application for the development, uh, which was noted as Exhibit C in the supplemental evidence, uh, was submitted in January 2020 and was consequently approved by the city, I believe, on July 22nd of this year. Um, I also wanted to reiterate a few things, uh, an item that has been discussed a couple times. There's only a few developments in the entire Golden Triangle District that are actually located within the floodplain. Um, these can be seen in the Exhibit A of the supplemental evidence that was provided. These developments include 151 First Side, which is located along the Fort Pitt Boulevard, uh, the Convention Center, and 1501 Penn Site. Uh, the 1501 Penn Avenue Site is the only site that's located in the GTB district um, that is impacted by the floodplain. And I've had, uh, I've had the experience with seven projects uh, located around this area in the, strip, in the strip district that are either constructed or currently under construction um, that are located within the floodplain and the raised occupied spaces in colonnade of 1501 Penn are entirely consistent uh, with these developments that I've worked on and also with the neighboring developments that have been reiterated on this project. Uh, moving on to the stormwater, just to review that real quick. And if you could go to slide 34 for me, please. So 
So the existing site, as everyone knows, is 100% impervious, and the design team was challenged to meet Title IX and Title 13 of the city code uh, for the stormwater management of this site. And the stormwater management's being addressed for volume control, rate control, and water quality by utilizing the two green roof systems that have been mentioned. The annex green roof system, which is the smaller system on the right, is a six inch deep media and is approximately 8,500 square feet. The tower green roof system, which is also a six inch deep media is the one on the left. And that's approximately 15,500 square feet. Uh, these two rain systems combined are designed to remove 5,426 cubic feet of stormwater volume for the one year storm event. So that's a pretty significant amount of stormwater that uh, these roofs are going to be removing um, that previous or that existing are all being discharged to combined sewers. Uh, the stormwater management will take a completely impervious site and convert it to a site that's showing 42% 40 pervious area and will ultimately discharge through underground roof leaders to the PDBSA public system in 15th Street and 16th Street. And as previously mentioned, this stormwater management uh, has been approved by the city and the date of approval was August 18th, 2020. Uh, Dusty, do you have any other uh, questions or comments regarding the floodplain or stormwater management? Thank you, Ben. We'll move on to Cindy Jampel, slide 44, please. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Cindy Jampel, principal of uh, Trans Associates Engineering Consultants, and I will walk you through beginning with slide 44. Uh, the transportation study that was prepared for this project. Uh, this first slide shows the calculation of parking and loading requirements as shown in the slide with 122 bicycle spaces which are provided a minimum of 730 parking spaces would be required. The site actually provides 846 parking spaces including uh, standard spaces, ADA's compacts, and electric vehicle charging spaces as well. Loading requirement is for six loading spaces. What's provided on the site is three uh, off-site loading spaces that are interior to the garage accommodating vehicles 30 and 40 feet long, as well as two uh, loading spaces for 15-minute loading and a request for an administrator exception for reduction in the number of loading spaces has been submitted uh, separately. Next slide, please. Uh, this graphic depicts the area of the uh, traffic study as required by DOMI, and there has been some evolution of what would be studied as part of this um, during our review and consultation with DOMI. Initially, we had a TIS scoping meeting in June of 2019, which showed access points that are different than the ones shown here. At the meeting with uh, DOMI and zoning uh, was the first time that we had heard about the 15th Street bicycle lane and other 15th Street, Smallman Street improvements. And we were asked to modify the access plan so as not to interrupt the, um, the usefulness of the bicycle lane. So we redid the TIS uh, scoping form and did another meeting and the access plan looks like what is shown now on this drawing, which includes garage access points on Penn Avenue and on the 16th Street Alley. Um, we su submitted that in August of 2019 and that was approved in September 2019. Then we prepared the report, which I'm sure is included in your materials, and was submitted in December of 2019. We've gone through several rounds of comments with DOMI, which um, were all important to the evolution of the access and utilization of uh, the parking garage and also the loading access. Uh, we got a first round of comments from DOMI in January of 2020, 
and uh, we were asked to uh, review uh, various alternative access plans, which uh, we did. We reviewed five different access plans and submitted documentation of those in February of 2020. Talked to Domi and got additional requests from them in March, March and May of 2020. Did an additional queuing and uh, technical analysis memo to address Domi's questions about the operation of these two access points. Um, and in the meantime, simultaneously submitted uh, documentation to Allegheny County, sent, submitted the report to them because the 16th Street Bridge is theirs, um, got comments from them, answered their comments, submitted those comment responses to Domi, sent everything to Domi July 22nd of this year, uh, additional responses on the 23rd, and Domi approved all the comment responses and the calculations and the TIS on July 24th of 2020. So there's what we studied and what was agreed upon through all of that. Next slide, please. Uh, one thing that uh, did come from our interaction with Domi is that the city's uh, strip district study prepared by Stantec includes uh, the installation of a new traffic signal by the city at 15th Street and Smallman Street, which we were instructed to include in our analysis and which we did as shown here. Next slide, please. The site does have multimodal opportunities and this slide presents the, uh, the public transit options in the area. As requested at the previous briefing, we have added the East Busway and the nearest East Busway station in uh, Lime Green on this slide. And also additional uh, bus stops are shown in blue, as blue dots on the slide. Next slide, please. Bicycle facilities are shown on this slide, uh, and we have added the, the lime green bike lane, which is part of the output of the Stantec study and which will be added on 15th Street immediately adjacent to the site as shown. And this will provide connection between Penn Avenue and uh, bicycling on Smallman Street and points to the west and north. Next slide, please. We performed the traffic analysis for morning and afternoon peak per weekday peak periods as uh, directed by Domi, uh, which included traffic generated by leaseholders in the garage, as well as um, some public parking as well, which would be available to some degree through the day and also on evenings and weekends. We had heard from uh, the, the retail uh, folks in the strip district that they're very concerned about having enough parking for their customers and they were uh, very supportive of having uh, some parking availability in this site so that has been included as part of our analysis. Uh, when we analyzed everything we determined that the intersections that we were required to study will function acceptably as shown. Next slide please. This slide depicts the Penn Avenue driveway into the parking garage. Penn Avenue is one way in the westbound direction, therefore the driveway will function as one lane entering, which will be a right turn in, and one lane exiting, which will be a right turn out. Vehicles will enter the driveway and go up the speed ramp, and then parking, gating, and control equipment will be placed at the top of the ramp to provide maximal uh, queuing area. This was all part of our iterative process with Domi to get maximum queuing space, one, by providing uh, additional physical distance, and two, by regulating who, which parkers may enter by which access point. And as agreed with Domi, we will use um, gating and program key cards to uh, control access for the leaseholders and approximately 25% of leaseholder parkers will use the Penn Avenue access with the remainder, the 75% using the 16th Street Alley to decrease the, um, the activity at the Penn Avenue access point. Public parkers, however, will be permitted to use uh, the Penn Avenue access point 
and they can use the one in the back too at 16th Street Alley, but they can also use this one as well. Next slide, please. This slide depicts the access to the uh, to the loading docks as shown. Uh, this is on Penn Avenue and will be a right in right out situation to enter this as well. There will be a garage door which will be opened uh, when there is truck activity. Truck activity is expected to be scheduled by the building management. And there will be a system at the garage door of uh, a traffic enunciator system that will involve both uh, visual and auditory cues so that pedestrians will know when the garage door is about to uh, be act activated and there will be truck activity. All truck maneuvering will occur off the site or off the street, I'm sorry, uh, completely contained within the garage as shown on this graphic. Next slide, please. This is a depiction of the uh, garage access point via the 16th Street Alley. This will be accessed by right in, right out at Smallman Street and then into the garage as shown and out. Um, the, at this location, as I had previously mentioned, where we will use gating and program key cards with 75% of the leaseholders accessing at this location. And then this uh, access point will also be open to the public. Next slide, please. An important part of transportation studies now is uh, a transportation demand management plan, which provides planning for the facility to assist uh, people in finding other ways to travel than single occupant vehicles. This results in uh, decreased traffic congestion, decrease, decreased pollution, and provides um, a slant to having people use active transportation as opposed to the single occupant vehicle mode. We have developed uh, and have had approved by DOMI a TDM plan for this building. Uh, it's longer than this, but some of the principal items are as shown on this slide. There will be an appointment of a building staff member as a TDM coordinator who will serve as a resource person for TDM measures. Um, support of residential permit parking uh, wherever it occurs or could occur. Uh, encouragement of tenants to maximize opportunities for employees to work remotely. And COVID-19 has provided that for now, but on an ongoing basis, uh, that will also be an option for employers. Establishment of an informational kiosk in the building with information on alternative transportation modes. Uh, encouraging tenants to have their employees participate in ride match, rideshare matching services uh, and offer parking cash out programs to their employees, distribution of leaflets on multimodalism. Uh, the bike room has been described in detail and serves as a, uh, a motivator for people to use bicycles as transportation. There will also be a workbench and some tools provided inside the secured bike room. Uh, providing information on the building website regarding Port Authority service, uh, pri establishing priority parking for carpools and van pools, and also providing uh, follow-up for TDM strategies uh, to DOMI in the form of a report at intervals to be specified by DOMI. Dusty, do you have additional items for me? No, thank you very much, Cindy. Next slide. In the interest of time, we're going to speed up here, uh, Madam Chair. These, this shows all the meetings that we've had with the community stakeholders over the last two years. We do have submitted a letter from the Strip District neighbors um, supporting this project. You also have received a number of letters from other neighbors in uh, the Strip District area supporting this project. Next slide. <clears throat> this shows all the meetings that we have had over the two year period with the city stakeholders. The last one being um, July 30th, where we met with Corey Lehman and Kate Rakus about the urban open space. And we received a follow up email saying that they were willing to work with us to help to further define 
this urban open space. And you heard from the Matt Casson and from Brandon Haw, Haw that the developer is still willing to continue to work to bring this ur urban open space um, to the level that will be, you know, make the, the city planning department feel more comfortable. Um, I just want to add one other thing uh, before we end. If you look at your own city maps, if you look at the SP8 and the RIV, there are areas that will have greater height than are now in the strip district. This is just the first project that is going to have greater height. Um, and it is in an area where there is no limitation. So I'll uh, reserve time to answer your questions and talk further, but I'm gonna turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Dusty. Okay, at this time we take public testimony. Is there anyone who is, uh, has indicated that they would like to speak with regards to this project? Uh, yes, we do have hands raised at this time. Andrew Miller, you're unmuted and please spell your name for the record. Uh, thank you. Andrew Miller, A-N-D-R-E-W Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R. And I am with CBRE Inc. So uh, we're part of the leasing team. Uh, I'm an office broker in downtown Pittsburgh, been doing this for 15 years. And I just wanted to note that the design and location of 1501 Penn Avenue serves a critical purpose related to employment growth and the connection of the CBR, CBD and the Strip District. Um, you know, the Strip has this awesome cluster of technology uh, firms that are really in their adolescence. You know, they haven't matured yet to the point where they're uh, at their full employment where they expect to get in the next couple of years, but they're no longer the scrappy startups either. Uh, and as these firms mature, they're gonna need office facilities that are exactly what 1501 Penn will provide for these uh, employers here in Pittsburgh. Uh, across the country, they're accustomed to having the large floor plate, buildings with size and scale, and best-in-class mechanical systems, parking, and amenities that, uh, frankly, nothing else in the Strip is able to offer right now. Um, if they're going to continue to hire and grow here, they're going to need to get these types of buildings in which to do so. Uh, so I think it'll serve the greater good there. Um, and uh, uh, the development really needs to be ahead of the demand changing that way. Uh, we can't start planning this building whenever the companies are already looking for 200,000 square feet for 1,000 employees. We have to be ahead of the curve and do what we're doing now. Um, the location obviously connects the strip to the CBD, uh, which has been the nucleus of business activity uh, for hundreds of years in Southwestern PA. And facilitating that connection is something that a lot of the uh, downtown stakeholders have been trying to achieve for the last few years. This building uh, has the location and the scale to really take that no man's land after the CBD ends and before the strip starts and uh, anchor and connect the two, which I think will uh, serve the greater good for everybody. Um, so that's all. Just wanted to go on the record making that comment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jeff Turconi, you're unmuted and please spell your name for the record. Jeff, you're unmuted. Um, we can see you're unmuted, but we name, sir. So. Jeff, can you hear us?
Jeff, I might suggest you call yeah. in on a landline or a phone line and we can take somebody else in advance. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay, I apologize. I'm not a big Zoom user, unfortunately. So let me start over. My name's Jeff Turconi, J-E-F-F Turconi, T-U-R-C-O-N-I. I'm here to speak on behalf of the project for JMC Holdings. I am the president of PJ Dick Construction here in Pittsburgh. Uh, PJ Dick has formed a partnership with the Dick Building Group uh, to form a joint venture to serve as the construction manager for JMC Holdings. Uh, we've been involved collectively with them for several months, helping to formulate plans and budgeting and scheduling. So it's a very uh, interesting and exciting project for us. Um, I think everybody probably knows that a project like this would be a, a terrific and welcome stimulus to the construction market, uh, especially in light of the pandemic. Um, we've come from a very busy market to what now is projected to be a very tight construction market over the next few months for sure. Um, we estimate that this project would contribute approximately $45 million towards uh, union level uh, construction wages and benefits. Uh, certainly a big economic uh, impact to the area uh, over a two year construction period. Um, this project we estimate would employ probably an average of 150 workers per month, uh, probably peaking out over 300 workers and would employ uh, estimated uh, 1,000 different construction workers on the project site. So again, tremendous opportunities to the construction and in general, the labor market. Uh, we would also implement a, a, a diverse and minority business program to make sure we provide uh, opportunities for small and minority businesses to participate in this project. So a great opportunity. We believe it's a wonderful project and um, certainly here to support JMC and, and, and everything that they're trying to bring to the city. Thank you. Thank you. No other hands are raised at this time. Okay, thank you. That ends public testimony. Is there uh, questions or comments from the commission? Commissioners, are you there? <laughs> Okay, uh, Commissioner Dietrich, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm gonna just give my punchline. I support the planning departments uh, to deny without prejudice project development plan for 2019026156 uh, for demo and new construction. This building is just really very disappointing. Um, uh, we spent a very long time at the beginning about context and I'll tell you a little bit more about the context. Pittsburgh was very unusual in most American cities or North American cities in that it's kind of stopped growing. And what would have been the first move of the wholesale district from the downtown to what would have been the edge of downtown, the strip, stayed there. Unlike pretty much everywhere else where it went out to the highway. Uh, and when you moved here and at the end of the 20th century, having a wholesale food district in your city right next to the downtown was very, very unusual. Um, that said, the contextuality of all that is this flow. The Allegheny flows to uh, the confluence with the Monongahela to form the Ohio. The railroad flows down, takes a turn, comes out. Smallman Street flows down, Penn Avenue flows down. The terminal building flows down. There's a lot of flow in the horizontal level until you see this building, which is stark, vertical. It's not within that context. It breaks the plane. I'm glad you, I thank you for bringing in the views. It breaks the plane on every view from the hillside of the hill, from the riverside, from the street side, 
And I'm probably not the only person that thinks it looks like a Lego office building from suburban Dallas or Houston uh, parked on top of that building. It's, it's not attractive. Um, it's massive. I support what Matt Falcone wrote about the size of it. I just, um, I think there's just so many problems with what could have been a really interesting and much more innovative project um, instead of what I, I really see as a massive overtaking of the view, a massive overtaking of, of, the, of, the, of the, it's obtrusive to the terminal building, it's obtrusive to the Allegheny River, it's obtrusive to the hillsides. Um, so I'm laying my cards up front on this one. Um, I will be supportive of the uh, recommendation to deny without prejudice project development 20190-2615. Thank you, Commissioner Dietrich. Commissioner Mingo, you had your hand up. I did. I have so much to say, and I know that I said a lot of it at the hearing, and I asked um, a bunch of questions, and I do appreciate um, that you responded to some of those um, questions with some additional information um, and tried to sort of think through responses to some of the issues that the commissioners brought up, and especially that I, that I brought up, because I do have some, some concerns about this building. Um, I agree with Sabina um, that this building is, um, you know, very massive. I do understand that it is allowed in this zoning to have this amount of height here. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, my issue, primary issue with this particular building is the, the way that the lower plinth of the building still very much looks like a solid rock. So we had this cold storage building that was there and now we have very similarly this very sharp edge, this sort of plinth that comes down. And so when you're looking down these views, down Penn Avenue, down Smallman Street, or even from a little bit from the river, you see this monolithic lower piece to it. Yes, you have this office tower that's above, um, but you have this very sharp edge. And I appreciated the discussion about the 10 story um, Penn Rose building that's next door or sort of, sort of next door underneath the 16th Bridger around the corner. Um, but that building has this lovely articulation as an old industrial building with these large windows that are going to provide um, in the evening, you know, can sort of light on the outside and allows for our imagination to think about what's happening on the inside. The plinth that you're creating is a parking garage. Um, and so you're not really giving us anything more than a, than a chunk of a building on a big block from a massing perspective. And so in that way, um, it, it yeah, I appreciate all the effort that you're going into to try and soften the Penn Avenue edge and certainly the amount of effort you've put into on the Smallman Street edge to try and help make it less of a no man's land, but the building itself is going to look like a gigantic um, barrier. And so for that reason, I, I, I can't support it. I think about you know, 11 Stanwyck Street and the neighbors that are nearby on Stanwyck Street built in the 60s, in the 70s, also in the floodplain and on the one side, this gigantic concrete plinth that separates the open space, semi-public space. But they on 11 Stanwyck Street, even if I don't like the way the building looks, they have a better approach to how the open space works. So my sort of second big problem with this project is this idea of open space. I understand that you have very thoughtfully designed and dealt with many of the issues that you have as a developer, as an architect, and you very thoughtfully solved them for yourself. The floodplain, the pedestrian throughway, the ADA compliance, um, but you have not created adequate open space. Our code has always had open space in it way before you thought about this project. So when you decided to do this project, you chose from the beginning to move it all the way to the edge and you said, oh, we'll be able to convince the city 
or the people that this open space, i.e. our pedestrian throughway, is going to work and qualify as open space for the city. So here's my feeling about this. There is, you have a sidewalk below, you have the colonnade that's above. There are many places in the world where colonnades do work. You know, Place de Vosges, colonnade, absolutely flat on a, on, a, on a place that's created. There's no place that's created here. And it's not absolutely flat, it has to be up high. So then where do we look for prototypes of where this is successful, where you have open space that still feels like public space with columns. So you can look at St. Peter's, perhaps Basilica, where you have massive plaza, columns, steps up, open space colonnade underneath. There's still a problem with that situation because the masses of the regular working class people were in the plaza. If you walk up into that colonnade, you don't quite feel welcome. You feel a little bit welcome, but not quite welcome. So you've done that with your steps and the colonnade. Okay, so maybe one could argue that one could sit on the steps and still not feel very um, out of place. But then you get to more of what happens at my house, my Victorian house, very typical Pittsburgh house, steps, probably nine feet above the sidewalk, lots of steps. I have a beautiful porch, right? 10 feet wide, your space is 14 feet wide. My house is very tiny, but I still have this 10 foot wide porch with a balustrade that is see-through and columns, okay? This is definitely private space. So I know that you can walk through your private space, but it is going to look like with that greenery, with the, with the nine foot thing, it's going to look and feel like private space. And how many times in our lives, maybe not some of you guys, but I grew up in a city in the 70s with very many of these sort of public, sort of public outdoor spaces. And how many times have I been asked by a security guard or somebody else what I am doing there? Even in our city, not that long ago with two of my children at a public plaza on Stanwyck Street, we were having a snack on the public plaza. A security guard walks up to me. It's supposed to be public and is like, and says, what are you doing here? Well, my husband is the tenant in this building. So they let me stay. Plus I didn't really look like I was getting into too much trouble. So now we have this space that you guys own that you're trying to claim as outdoor space that doesn't really work as outdoor space. It's really private space. Part of it might work. And so for me, this is a design problem. You are great designers and you started this project not solving this very basic design problem that any one of, a, of an architect could have thought through and said, ah. and so you decided to risk that in fact, we would be okay with using your absolutely essential public circulation path that you need to be ADA compliant to get into your retail as open space. I'm not, it does not work for me. So that's my second problem with this building. Um, and my third problem is that this is not a building that says anything about Pittsburgh. Um, it, it doesn't, it's, it could be anywhere in the country. Um, it doesn't really respond to the place. I'm not sure why this building is for Pittsburgh other than you say it has steel and that's not exactly our identity these days. That was, it's a historical identity. Um, and I get it, but it's not something that many people are attached to. Um, and I think I'm almost done. I'm glad you provided a river view, although I'm not completely satisfied that we've seen how the river view and the views from the river have um, been blocked by your building and or add to the building. We see one very small view of the river view that you provided, but the river is in fact, that view is very important to us. Um, let me see if I have any other comments. I think that's it. There probably are more comments, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments from the commission? Um, uh, I'll just have a couple comments. Um, 
just two, one about big dimensions and one about little dimensions. Um, I, it, I'm still kind of flummoxed by the big dimensions in the tower portion of this project. And I understand that it's a pro forma based market driven thing that the large floor plates are perhaps desirable. I think that the height of this building hasn't been an issue. It's the massing of the building um, from all dimensions that just seems so out of place. And the only other building I can think of that has nearly an acre per floor downtown is the US Steel Building. And almost all buildings that have large floor plates have some sort of ground plane plaza that allows some sort of flow of activity of those tenants out to that space that is elevated in this project above the parking garage. And, and I'm, I'm sad if those, if those office workers never come down to the, the street level because, because of that presence there. Um, I can't imagine that somebody wants to have their office tucked in that back inner, inner bay where there's no light and no views and fresh air is left to the mechanical system. Um, but that's, that's kind of neither here nor there. Um, thank you for showing the um, materials on that. I do have a better understanding of what those are and I appreciate the, the level of thinking in terms of butt glazing and uh, the kind of spareness of that. Um, the little dimensions that, the comment I have on little dimensions has to do with the public space. And I think the other commissioners um, spoke strongly about um, other ways public space has been treated. I'm gonna to go to a very small dimension. When I look at the site plan, there is a nine foot sidewalk approximately. We know that our regulations call for three foot tree pits, which leaves about a six foot walkway between the bottom of the stairs or the edge of the wall and for people to walk. So as a kind of sensibility of this public space and where I feel welcome or uh, you know how your building meets the street, it still takes a very, small little public space existing public realm area and doesn't add to it pulling the stairs back or pulling the building back even further so that that ground plane leaks into that area that is covered by a building would have a sense of being welcome to it and so it's even in the kind of small little pieces of it I, I appreciate the activation of that zone I, I'm not convinced that it feels public and it certainly doesn't feel public when it's a kind of perfunctory element like a um, like a ADA ramp. So it, I don't, you know, that's just something that has to be solved in a building, but it's certainly not some, uh, it's not a place to stay. It's a place to go through. And so I'm not convinced that the places that have been created are places to stay, which is something that I would consider as prerequisite to open space um, as opposed to circulation. So um, those are those are my comments. Um, uh, any other comments from the commissioners? Okay, commissioners hearing none. Um, um, Christine, I had a question. Yep. This is Commissioner Blackwell. Is do we have to vote saw you know a firm no or yes, or can we um, I don't know the right term, extended or ask them to come back in two weeks because it sounds like the main concern at this point may be the mechanical issue without the circulation of organic air or even views for certain office spaces. And then also the walkabout, walking, welcoming space on the main street um, are those things that the owner and developer are willing to look at again, maybe one more time. Um, I, if I could ask Corey. I'm, I'm, Commissioner, yeah. Commissioner Blackwell, my comments weren't about the mechanics. They were about the building, the massiveness. I was referring the, to- the Lack of consent. This isn't something they're gonna correct in two weeks. I mean, if they're gonna make change, if they would decide to make changes or whatever vote we take, this it's not a two week deal. Well, I was referring to Christine's comment. I apologize if I wasn't clear. And so, um, uh, Commissioner Blackwell, maybe I could ask uh, uh, Director Andrew Dash or uh, Corey Lehman, uh, Zoning Administrator Corey Lehman, to tell us about the 
what is implied in the staff recommendation of denial without prejudice. So uh, Commissioner Blackwell can understand that recommended motion. Sure, I'm happy to speak to that. So uh, yeah, if that's okay, Andrew. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the recommendation for denial without prejudice is a little bit different than a uh, recommendation for denial, uh, just denial, uh, which would um, preclude someone from coming back with a, with a very similar application. Uh, denial without prejudice allows the applicant to continue to work on um, to potentially address specific issues uh, by the commission uh, and allows them to come back with the same application, the same project uh, for the commission to review without any prejudice from the, from the prior action of the commission. Uh, that would be different than tabling or continuing. Uh, and uh, this has been, uh, it's not unprecedented for the commission to, to use this uh, action. And that's what staff felt was most appropriate based on the review criteria as is laid out on the, in the report. Thank you, Corey. Mm -hmm. So uh, commissioners, is, is there anyone that would like to make a motion on the staff recommendation? So moved. So moved, Commissioner Mingo. Could we have the, please read the, the full thing so we know what we're, we're supporting or, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I could ask staff, I have to, I'll have to dig through my folders to find that. Could, if you have yeah, it. I can read it, give me one second. Yeah. Uh, that the planning commission of the city of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. denies without prejudice Pittsburgh. project development plan, DCP ZDR 2019, 02015 for demolition and new construction at 1501 Penn Avenue, filed by R3A Architects on behalf of the owner, 1501 Penn Owner LLC. The applicant is encouraged to continue to work on the building and site design and return to the commission. I move that we support to deny without prejudice uh, the uh, project development plan 02015. Oh, 2019021015 for demolition and new construction. Uh, Sabina, can I put you in as a second? Because Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, let me second. Sorry. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, Commissioners will do a roll call. Um, Commissioner Blackwell? I'm going to stay. Um, Commissioner Dietrich? Aye, support deny. Okay, Commissioner Dick? Aye. Okay, Commissioner Mingo. Aye. Okay, Commissioner Mondor, aye. Okay, that uh, it passed, that staff recommendation passes, the project can return back to us um, without prejudice and uh, we can continue the conversation. Okay, thank you. If we could take five minutes just to uh, move a uh, five, little five minute break so that everybody can move to where they need to and um, we'll do plan of lots.
All right, commissioners, as you come back in, let's turn the cameras on. Mr. Shepke, are we able to batch? Yeah, um, the staff's recommended motion is the same for all six applications, so we can batch them all. And there are no majors? There's two majors, they're here in their second meeting. Okay, great. I'm sorry, was that supposed to be on? No, I'm sorry, it doesn't have to oh, okay. be on. Okay, yeah. sorry, I forgot. I'll take it back off. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Dick, Commissioner Mingo, Commissioner O'Neill. We'll wait for Commissioner Dietrich. Okay, and Commissioner Blackwell, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. And Commissioner Dick, are you there? I'll give Commissioner Dick one more minute. Oh, you're here? Okay. Yes, oh, I'm here. You're I'm here. I'm sorry. Did. I couldn't get unmuted. I don't know what yeah, problem yes. <laughs> I saw your button go off, Holly. I knew you were there. All right. Yeah. Send us a smoke signal. That's good. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, um, court reporter, I'll do a countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. Okay, run. Uh, Okay, so now we move on to the plan of lots. We have six items on plan of lots. I'll read through all six for those who might be on the phone. Uh, number one is DCP lot 2020-0008, Asafras Way, Polish. I'm sorry, you broke up lot, uh, DCP lot 2020-00. address, Sassafras Way, Polish Hill. Item two is DCP lot 2020 address General Robinson subdivision, North Shore. Uh, item three is DCP lot 2020 address 425 Wyola Street, Duquesne Heights. Item four is DCP lot 2020 um, Jafara Homes, North Oakland. Item five is DCP lot 2020-00939, Island Avenue, California, Kirkbride. And item six is DCP lot 2020-00951, Cliff Street, Crawford Roberts. We will hear all six um, at one time, unless anyone has any need to abstain from any of these items or uh, recuse themselves. Okay, then uh, Dana, why don't you uh, present all six of these and we can batch them in one vote. The first item on plan of lots is the Sassafras Way consolidation. This is the consolidation of three parcels into one parcel. Lot one would have 392 feet of frontage on Sassafras Way, 192 feet of frontage on 33rd Street and would be 60,607 square feet in area. A two-story building is located on the subject property, and this is a major subdivision that was first reviewed by the Planning Commission on August 25th. Uh, staff is recommending approval. The next item on plan of lots is the General Robinson subdivision. This is the subdivision of one parcel into three parcels. Lot 10.1 would have 133 feet of frontage on Mazeroski Way, 157 feet of frontage on West General Robinson Street, it would be 23,699 square feet in area. Lot 10.2 would have 160 feet of frontage on Mazeroski Way, 277 feet of frontage on North Shore Drive. It would be 48,062 square feet in area. Lot 10.3 would have 388 feet of frontage on West General Robinson Street. It would be 39,919 square feet in area. The subject property is currently used as a parking lot and this is a major subdivision that was first reviewed by the Planning Commission on August 25th, 2020. Staff is recommending approval of the General Robinson subdivision. The next item is the 425 Wyola lot line revision. This is a lot line revision involving two parcels. 
the revised lot one would have 35 feet of frontage on Wyola Street and would be 3,150 square feet in area. Lot two would have 35 feet of frontage on Wyola Street and would be 3,150 square feet in area. No new parcels are created in this plan and the subject property is currently vacant. Staff is re recommending approval of the 425 Wyola lot line revision. The next item is the Jafara Homes Consolidation. This is the consolidation of two parcels into one parcel. The lot would have 75 feet of frontage on North Craig Street. It would be 11,067 square feet in area. The subject property is currently vacant and staff is recommending approval of the Jafara Homes Consolidation. The next item is the Island Avenue Consolidation. This is the consolidation of two parcels into one parcel. The lot would have 83 feet of frontage on Island Avenue and would be 16,225 square feet in area. A house is located on the subject property and staff is recommending approval of the Island Avenue consolidation. The next item is the Cliff Street consolidation. This is the consolidation of three parcels into one parcel. The lot would have 60 feet of frontage on Cliff Street and would be 4,110 square feet in area. The subject property is currently vacant and staff is recommending approval of the Cliff Street consolidation. Thank you. Okay, that takes us through items one through six. At this time, is there anyone who would like to, to speak with regards to this, these projects, these applications? Uh, no hands are raised at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions or comments by the commission? Um, I move that we approve uh, all these lots as recommended by the uh, staff. We have a second. A second. Second, Commissioner Blackwell. That was a uh, move by Commissioner Dick, second by uh, Commissioner Blackwell. Okay, uh, Commissioner Blackwell, your vote. Aye. Commissioner Dietrich. Aye. Commissioner Dick. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Mingo. Aye. Commissioner Mondor. Aye. Commissioner O'Neill. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Is she abstained? No. No. Aye. Oh, thank you. All right. That takes us to director's reports. Uh, do we have a director's report today? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, so, um, you know, I wanted to go over, we had talked about this in uh, a couple of prior commission meetings. I uh, just wanted to discuss the forging PGH comforts of plan uh, now that uh, the launch has occurred um, and be able to discuss, uh, you know, what we see as the timeline uh, for the plan, the actions for the plan and commission involvement in the plan. Uh, so, so with that, if we can just um, move to the next slide. Um, the citywide comprehensive plan, it is intended to be a citywide land use plan that is a strategic framework and vision for growth and development. The time horizon for the plan is the next 20 years. Um, you know, so, you know, you know, this is an overarching policy document that will shape how we look at land use and how we look at the uh, components of development in the city that relate to land use. Uh, so things like housing policy, economic development policy, mobility policy, specifically around uh, land use. Uh, next, please. So this is built off and we'll talk about how we're building off of, uh, I think, you know, and, you know, sh shortly, a lot of recent planning efforts, uh, planning efforts that have occurred in our open space and recreation, uh, mobility and transportation, uh, preservation, um, equitable development, uh, you know, there's a lot of plans uh, that have occurred both by the Department of City Planning, the city of Pittsburgh and by other partners. And so, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about how, how that integration will occur. Uh, but one of the things that out of all of those is that there hasn't been anything that has really solely been focused on, you know, on land use and, you know, and how uh, the city is looking to develop. Uh, next, please. And so right before uh, pandemic times and virtual commission meetings, uh, you know, I had presented to uh, commissioners around the conditions and trends report. Uh, this was 
a document that we were looking to release uh, and, and have released now as a part of the launch of the comprehensive plan. And really it acts as an existing conditions report to uh, showcase um, you know, the city and the city's growth and what the city looks like today and how that shapes us looking at citywide planning. And so um, it you know, looks at, you know, if, go next slide, please. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of based and modeled off of uh, the P4, uh, the you know, people, place, planet, and performance. And you know, the content of the guide is here. Um, we'll talk about where that it can be found. And I know back in March, I do believe we were, uh, made sure that commissioners had a paper copy of the document at that time. Uh, next, please. Some of the things that came out of uh, the conditions and trends report uh, was a focus on, uh, you know, a, a something we created the displacement vulnerability index. Uh, what that is, is a trying to create a focus on places where uh, due to uh, market economics or due to, um, you know, the, the people that are living in certain neighborhoods, um, there, you know, our data shows that there is more vulnerability for displacement as development occurs. And so uh, what we wanna do is be able to focus in those areas to make sure that what we see as the future of the city and what we see as the future of development in the city is one that really protects uh, residents and places um, you know, that have that increased vulnerability. Um, in addition to that, uh, we, you know, like stated, uh, used the you know, kind of local framework of P4 uh, that the mayor has used uh, now uh, for the past uh, yes, five, five, six years, and uh, the you know, international framework of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which we've been uh, working to integrate as you know, we brought to the commission our neighborhood planning guide, and similarly would be orienting uh, the comprehensive plan work to that as well. Uh, next slide, please. And so, you know, in that conditions and trend support, it does talk about, you know, kind of what has gone on in the history of our city, um, you know, from, you know, where we've been able to look uh, purely at, you know, purely at population change, um, as well as some of the things that have caused some of those changes, as well as some of the things that have created change in certain neighborhoods and, you know, as opposed to others. And so, uh, you know, definitely if you haven't, commissioners would suggest that you, I mean, look through and it does talk about how things like redlining, uh, oh the, the, you know, things like, things like redlining uh, that occurred, you know, in Pittsburgh, the same as it did in, you know, across the country, but how it directly affected uh, population change and development change uh, in, in neighborhoods that were redlined versus neighborhoods that weren't. And so understanding how, uh, some of those choices that have been made, um, you know, both by policymakers at the city level and policymakers more nationally have affected the city over time and affect the city that we have today. Uh, next, please. And so as a part of that report as well, we do start to look at what we see as the forecast for growth uh, for the city. And so from a population standpoint, uh, that you know that you know what we have today shows that there is a range of 20 to 40,000 additional people that we can expect, residents that we can expect in the city of Pittsburgh uh, over the next 20 years. Next, please, and that we can expect to see somewhere in the range of 15 to 40,000 additional jobs. And so you know, so you know, noting that you know after a long period of population decline. Uh, the city is poised for growth, and so you know, which which really underlies uh, the reason to be doing this comprehensive planning work now. Next, please. It's at three hundred thousand. And so, uh, you know, with that, uh, the process that we'll be using is a scenario planning process. Uh, we'll be you know kind of identifying a trend scenario then working through uh, public outreach to identify and create alternative scenarios uh, for the public to then um, you know, be able to respond to and be able to engage with us on. Uh, next slide. And in addition to, um, you know, like I said, with those existing plans and you know, continue to talk about it when we talk about working groups, um, you know, we will be integrating 
the city's neighborhood plans. Uh, so the neighborhood plans are already adopted by the Planning Commission as a part of the city's comprehensive plan. I will be carrying forth the recommendations, the information on those uh, into forging PGH into you know as you know as the um, you know as a part of the comprehensive plan. In addition, the comprehensive plan will then serve as the guide for future neighborhood plans. So this, you know, the, the forging PGH comprehensive plan will not have the level of detail that a neighborhood plan has in it, um, but it will start to show where we're growing, how we see growth occurring, and what our overall city policies are around growth to then start to work at the street, the block by block, street by street um, details in future neighborhood plans that the department works on and that come to the commission. Next, please. So uh, where we are right now, um, we had the kickoff event um, a, a couple of weeks ago uh, with the mayor. Um, we have right now uh, the, you know, the online engagement through Engage PGH, uh, which uh, we released last month. So, um, you know, we will be doing that to really start to understand uh, what kind of change residents want to see, where they see potential issues, and how they see the city growing. Um, we will be doing focus groups in particular areas uh, that, were, that were higher in the Displacement Vulnerability Index. Again, doing some additional deeper dive and focusing on those neighborhoods. Um, we'll be taking that information and coming back to the public with specific scenarios for, uh, for, for them to, to respond to uh, early next year. And then, be, and then be spending the springtime of 21 refining that preferred growth scenario. Um, after we refine that, that preferred growth scenario, the intention is that we would then uh, build a plan document with supportive housing and economic development and other policies uh, to support that land use vision. Um, the intention is that this is, you know, essentially a 12-month process uh, that we'd, we'd be undergoing uh, from the kickoff that we have now uh, to, uh, to adoption and implementation. Next, please. So, um, you know, the comprehensive plan website is forgingpgh.org. Uh, you can go there that has um, a number of tools uh, that are available, um, including the conditions and trends report. A lot of those pl past planning efforts are all located there as well. Um, you know, kind of sorted by where they are uh, relative to the P4 and where they fall under that. Um, we'll have opportunities for, you know, it will direct you to opportunities for engagement. The opportunities for engagement I'll talk about uh, on the Engage site um, and, you know, provide additional uh, resources for folks, including, next slide, please, um, the data visualization tool, which was released alongside the conditions and trends report. Um, this looks at a series of data metrics, both at the neighborhood level, as well as at the citywide level, um, to be able to help residents understand uh, what's going on with their neighborhoods now, um, as they work with us to try to decide uh, what the future should look like. Uh, next, please. And then uh, the engagement uh, right now, obviously we are in uh, the midst of a pandemic. So um, engagement in person is, uh, you know, is, is pretty difficult. So right now we're focusing all of our engagement through uh, the city's engagement site. Um, you know, so if you go to Engage PGH, uh, we have a page there uh, for the comprehensive plan uh, that, that is available both in English and in Spanish uh, translations, um, you know, where you can go do a survey, uh, do an accompanying map, map exercise. Um, I believe at this point in time, uh, you know, we've, we've in the first uh, couple of weeks of its opening, I believe that we have uh, 800 different response, you know, different, re you know, residents that have responded so far, um, you know, we'll be continuing uh, to um, use the Engage platform uh, for this initial round of public engagement. Next, please. We'll be doing a series of focus groups, like I said, in those areas that are 
higher for the displacement vulnerability index. Uh, they're outlined uh, here on the map, um, being primarily in the lower middle north side, uh, some areas of the West End, some areas of the Southern Hilltop, uh, areas in and around the Hill District, uh, areas in and around, uh, you know, kind of Larmer, East Liberty uh, in those areas, and then in Hazelwood, uh, in and around Hazelwood. Next slide, please. And then in addition to public engagement, we'll have these series of working groups around the topics that you see on the screen, housing, mobility, economic development, recreation and open space, environment and energy and equity. These are areas where there's a lot of citywide planning that has occurred or city planning that has occurred. And so what we'll be doing is looking, using these working groups and using the staff who created the plans that, that, that will be a part of these working groups uh, to be able to thread the information of those plans uh, through the public engagement and through the things that residents will, will be hearing from residents uh, through the forging PGH, um, uh, the public engagement. And so um, one of the places that we do see a role for, uh, for commissioners will be, um, you know, in these working groups as we are working to, um, you know, to process all of these planning efforts that have occurred and relate that to uh, the scenarios that are built for um, the public engagements, as well as the final scenario that is selected by residents and developed by residents uh, for the future of Pittsburgh. So with that, I'll um, open it up to any questions uh, that commissioners may have. And Anthony Kobach, I'm sorry, I, I just jumped in and started presenting. Uh, Anthony Kobach also is here. Uh, he is the project manager on this work. And so between he and I, we can answer any questions that you all may have. Great. Thanks for, um, thanks for the report out. And I think that's really helpful. How, um, have folks had a chance to look at the website and the document? No, I have not yet. I'm sorry, um, but I, are there is is there any particular section under the particularly the pol policy section that uh, talks in, in detail about uh, promoting the uh, building of affordable housing in the city? Um, well, I mean, you know, th there is some discussion around that uh, in the conditions and trends report. Um, you know, I mean, one of the one of the map ex one of the parts of the map exercise that's available right now on the engage site does, uh, you know, ask for people to show us opportunities for uh, additional affordable housing. Um, mm -hmm. We and I forgot to I, I, I forgot to mention in trying to fly through, um, you know, although there are a lot of existing plans around housing and economic development, we will and have RFPs out uh, right now to have some consultant assistance to help us update the housing needs assessment uh, that was done in 2015. So we will be um, as a part of the housing working group, group bringing back members of the affordable housing task force to help guide us through that work. Um, we will also have, we also have an RFP that's out right now uh, for assistance in economic development strategy. So being able to, you know, with a focus on land use. So understanding, um, you know, on the housing side, where, where, our, where we've gone in the last five years, as far as, you know, items like affordability, as far as unit mix, as far as what, uh, you know, the market is uh, for, for specific types of housing so that we can start to generate land use scenarios that, that reflect that. Uh, and similarly with jobs. So how do we look at, you know, emerging industries in Pittsburgh? How do we look at, you know, the supply chain of those industries? So as an example, if you're a student at Pitt with a great idea, you make it from, you know, your time in university to your time in a lab, to your time as a startup, to your time as an emerging, as an emerging industry, how do we try to provide a lot, you know, all of those building types and land use types uh, in the city as we think about how we will be adding jobs and adding residents over the next 20 years. So uh, thank you. It's a really great resource to have this because in many times when we're in deliberations talking about neighborhood plans and we ask for data, there's an underlying set of assumptions that would go into that. And so we're going to be getting some of that information that we can draw upon. So while it might not show up, directly in the things that we uh, think about when we're at the table, so to speak. It, it, we need to have this information in our minds to understand how these kinds of systems are working um, for projects, for plans, things like that. Um, 
I, uh, Andrew and I have been talking about where there might be opportunities for um, outreach to planning commissioners to be part of some of these um, processes. Um, I know that Fred served on the task, the housing task force. Um, and in the past, there have been commissioners that have been involved in some of the um, work as it's ongoing instead of waiting for it to just show up for us uh, at the end. So um, we'll, we'll uh, be having those conversations in more detail. Yeah, and so we'll be having, you know, an open call with commissioners on the various topics uh, that'll be there, you know, would encourage participation. Um, the, those working groups, we see those um, meetings, you know, five to seven times over starting in November and ending in June. So over about a nine month period, um, that would be the expectation uh, for for commissioners. Um, and, you know, ultimately, um, the intent of this is that it will be a guidepost uh, for commission activity. It will be the thing that guides zoning reform uh, that the city that the city will be pursuing in um, in line with that land use strategy. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, the you know, it's it's kind of forming the building blocks now, uh, you know, for a lot of these things um, that you know will. You know, kind of form the you know the future city, so definitely encourage uh, commissioners to participate. Andrew, we we all know everyone at SPC, but you know they've never put out a forecast, but didn't have happy population growth um, for the last fifty years. <laughs> well, that, that's that's what's yeah that's on the presentation, but we've uh, we've looked beyond that. Uh, yes, and yeah, I, I mean the, the big thing too for us is what it says about vacant land. I mean. If you're going to keep basically you've got a lot of people you've got the apartment dwellers and now with covid you got all these you know every day in the new york times there's another article about the 35 year old couple with two kids who decide brooklyn's really not for them anymore and they're you know hightailing it out to maplewood with a you know yard and and the same thing it's a it's a millennial it's a generational thing covid might have forced it but when people get to a certain age and they have children um they look at their neighborhood in a different way and the Kind of things that they're looking at they're looking at the schools they're looking at play areas they're looking at all the other stuff um and the kind of housing we've built post great recession is you know largely rental largely you know one two person apartments um some high-end condos some high-end townhouses but the real what does it say about being to to holly's point to ho affordable housing and also what you're going to call midstream housing where we have a lot of places in the south hills that might meet that market but some, you know, we need, maybe some of those areas need some attention. So I wanna see what it's, it's gonna say about that. Yeah, and I, and I think that there's, and, and I, I've, I've heard Commissioner Mingo mention it a number of times at commission meetings, uh, you know, just how we ensure that we're building, you know, opportunity for people who live in our neighborhoods now, um, you know, and how, you know, through land use changes or other ways that, you know, people can, you know, use the fact that they've, you know, owned and lived in real estate in Pittsburgh for generations to be able to take advantage of that while also making sure that there are opportunities for new people of, of all income types and of, and, and of all backgrounds. Uh, so yeah, so definitely agree, um, you know, definitely excited, uh, you know, and I think the staff is pretty excited to, to be taking this on. And uh, like I said, you know, as as much participation as as we can have, uh, you know, from from everyone. Uh, and, you know, I mean, you know, we're you know, broadcast, so you know, I mean, obviously, you know, do want you know anyone to be able to participate in any way that they can. Uh, Director Dash, thank you for a report and for your regular reports. I think it's great to hear from you on this regular basis. So thank you for that. And staff, thank you for sticking around. Commissioners, thank you for sticking around. Um, yes. Do we have a motion to, I almost said succeed, but that's not what I meant. I meant, do we have a motion to adjourn? Adjourn, that's it. That's adjourn. it. Adjourn, adjourn, <laughs> succeed, And that's the wrong thing. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Bye bye. Everyone, thank you. Kate. Kate. Yeah. Can you stay on for one one minute? Um. We're still live on YouTube. Okay.
I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later. Okay.